And we will, so welcome everyone to the Environmental Justice Coalition meeting, meeting nine, which is exciting. Um, and we have an exciting day in front of us. So um, why don't we just dive right in? I'm gonna, we'll start with some intros around the table and then uh, move through some of our, our agenda, talk about our meeting purpose. Before we get there, uh, reminded of the Climate Commitment Act. Thanks for funding this wonderful work that we all get to do together. Uh, we can go to the next slide and, and just provide some welcome. But I don't know, Jenna, did you want to say anything before we move into introductions? Uh, I, uh, nothing yet. Uh, welcome, everyone, and look forward to today's conversation. Okay, thanks. We won't we won't have you spoil your your talking points that are upcoming. So why don't we do a, a quick roll call? Um, we'll flash the the slide of some of the staff, and, and we have several of the consultant team members here who will also introduce themselves when they um, get going. But why don't we start with our uh, our EJC members? Monica, do you want to lead us off? Yeah, I might ask you. Awesome. Hi everybody, Monica Zazueta um, from uh, Vice President Vice President of, of Vancouver Metro LULAC, Council Number 47026. Um, it's been a minute, um, but I know this um, this is my passion, and I am so happy to be back. Um, and um, I wish I could see everybody's face. All I can see is you know Ben, but you're Ben. It's cool to see you. <laughs> but um, I am looking forward to um, continuing um, the good work together. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Monica. Y'all need to put it on the gallery view. You don't want to suffer through my big face in in, in the front. So, Monica, it's great okay. to have you. <laughs> great to have you. Um, Abby. Hello, everyone. Um, my name's Abby Hallapeter. I'm with Odyssey World International. Um, I think I zoned for the the introduction. What else did I not cover? That was it. it was just, okay. you know, Introduction, just letting the folks know who's here, particularly for folks in the audience. Perfect. Okay. Well, I'm happy to be here. Thank you all. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jude? Hi, Jude Wade here, representing the Farm and Food Justice Network. Thank you, Jude. Uh, Gabriella? Hi everyone, Gabriela Mendoza Ewing with Hispanic Disability Support of Southwest Washington, Pasitos Gigantes. Great right. to see you. Thank you, Gab Gabriela. Um, Alana? Good afternoon, everyone. Alana Tadella with the Pacific Islander Health Court of Washington. Thank you. Ana? Hello, everyone. Uh, Ana Karen Betancur Macias here with Latino Leadership Northwest, and it's nice uh, seeing y'all today. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. Hi, everybody. Rebecca O'Brien with the Free Clinic of Southwest Washington. Thank you, Yolanda. Hey, I'm trying to get off mute here. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Yolanda Fraser. I'm the president of our local NAACP National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Vancouver, Washington, Chapter 1139D. Thank you so much. Thank you. Almanja? EJC member with Fourth Point Forward, and happy to see you, see you all today. Right. So, um, any other EJC members I missed? Okay. And then other folks that, that join the conversation, I'll just have you introduce yourself um, when you're when you're on that portion of the agenda. So I'm going to keep moving us. We've got a, a really busy, um, packed conversation to, to have today. Just as a point of some housekeeping reminders, Maria just put in the chat, if you're having any Zoom issues, um, you can email her and she can help you work through those. Um, as a reminder, you have a chat function at the bottom. I'll just ask that you uh, make sure your chat settings are are for everyone. Um, the raise hand button is also at uh, the bottom of your screen, so um, we can use that to get in the queue. 
course, we're we're a happy family here. Phil, use your human hands, come off mute. I'll keep an eye out uh, make sure that uh, we can hear from everyone. So as a reminder, you're surrounded uh, by uh, myself, Ben Duncan, your facilitator. Um, I got Nicole and, and Maria here to, to help support this meeting. And then, of course, your, your uh, friends at Clark County. Um, to help move this process, and and we'll uh, re-welcome um, Dana um, and and uh, and Tracy um, here today to, to help us move through some of these conversations. Um, I didn't see the uh, Otter AI, um, but a reminder: please don't use um, the AI tools. We are taking uh, meeting notes, and we'll as always send a summary around. So. Um, again, you all have been uh, really good about um, participating in that way. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, so as we have, it's, it's, it's a pretty exciting conversation um, that we're hoping to have today. And, you know, the, the high level objective building again on this foundation of work that you all have been such a critical part of. Um, is to actually take the work that we've done, not just the engagement work that you did and the resilience policy work that's been done, um, but to lift up the work that, that you all did around the environmental justice lens to actually apply some of those considerations to draft policies. Um, and so it really is kind of an opportunity for, for you all as EJC members to kind of put that put those values into action, if you will, uh, which is really exciting to, to see what that conversation looks like and to really get your input um, and thinking about some of the policies that uh, will help support um, resilience in our in our community. Um, we can go to the next slide. So as we um, move through our time together in order to support the objective, uh, we will get a little bit of time to get some project updates. Um, if there's anything that you all want to share, we didn't include a, a part of our agenda today around the um, kind of announcements. So certainly feel free to put stuff in the chat. We can share by email, um, but we will get some project updates. Um, we'll we'll get a refresher. Um, it's been a while since since Dana's joined us to kind of talk about. Uh, resilience. Uh, we'll we'll kind of overlay that refresher with the work uh, that you all did as part of your engagement, and then we'll spend the bulk of our time together um, applying and thinking about how we can connect the environmental justice and equity lens to these policies, really with some high level um, overview and 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 guidance uh, in order to have that conversation. As always, we will include uh, wrap up our meeting with uh, space for public comment. So for any of our audience members, if you're interested in providing input to this group, um, please hang tight and we'll we'll create that space at the end of our conversation and then we'll wrap up, talk about next steps and get you out of here by 6.30. Any questions about the agenda? Okay. Um, I did want to, before we keep going, um, do we have a slide for the meeting notes? Um, no. Okay. Um, we have a question. There it is. Yes. Thank you. Monica, is that a hand? Yes. Hi. Yes. Um, Monica says, what the, um, before the meeting started, um, there's um, some members of the community here today with us. Um, and just like over there um, in the uh, county meetings, um, the, the time to speak um, comes like at the end and, you know, people have busy lives and everything. And so I was wondering maybe um, if there's a way we could move public comment um, to the beginning of the meetings. That way, um, I, I think, I don't know, I, I don't know, they made a comment and I just wanted to share it. Um, so that, because I, I feel the same way with the county meetings too, that it's like, oh gosh, I have to stay for this whole thing. Um, but I, I don't know if that could be something we could do. Well, I we haven't built a kind of a process check for that. So I'll look a little bit to my Clark County folks. I, I, I can't see the people in the room. So are they, are the people interested in providing public comment today? Was that the intent of being in the room? Yes. Monica, thanks for bringing us in. But we just came as observers okay. actually. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. Awesome. Thanks for your thoughts. No. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. No. I get there's there's observers today, but yeah, I just okay. wanted to make sure. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That's, that's All right. Thank really, you. Really fair, Monica. I appreciate that and appreciate you naming it. And um, certainly, there's there's opportunities for written comments as you see in the chat. Um, 
and then if, if at any point, I guess, in, the, in our subsequent meetings going forward, if if we have folks that have time constraints and are interested in public comment, um, we we can propose that as an agenda shift. So I I think we can we can always hold that flexibility and switch those that dedicated time if we need to. So thanks for raising it. Um, I do want to say that if folks have had a chance to look at the EJC meeting summary from our last conversation, I'll just ask if there's any edits or corrections. Okay, not seeing up. If I could just get a thumbs up, had, had not some indication that we're, we're good to uh, consider the meeting number eight approved. Thank you. Rebecca, I'm going to assume that's the thumbs up since there's maybe not a thumbs up option. So thank you for that. Okay, so Eddie, um, we'll, we'll keep. Thank you, Alana. Let's keep moving forward. Uh, let's actually, actually, let's pause real quick. So Min, Johanna, um, can we bring you in? Min, you want to say hello? Welcome. Hello. Hello. Who are you, Ben? Do you represent an organization? Hi. Um, so Oh, How do I introduce okay. myself? Yeah, Johanna, just wait. That's uh, let uh, Min to finish. Just say hello. Yeah, uh, my name is Min Pham. I'm the uh, president of the Vietnamese community in Clark County here. Great. Thank you. Welcome. And Johanna? Hello, my name is Johanna Inoki. I work for the Pacific Islander Community Association. Um, I've just started um, in September with PICA, and um, so I'm glad to be able to join the EJC. Great, thank you. Um, and sorry for my team jumping around. I'm just going wherever I want to go today. So if we go back to the participation tips, slide seven, <laughs> keeping you on your toes. Um, just as a reminder, particularly for those in the audience, so our Environmental Justice Coalition members are here as panelists. Members of the public are here as attendees. Um, so for EJC members, um, you'll stay on mute when not talking or jumping into the conversation. Um, we do encourage video as much as possible. Um, for members of the public, uh, outside of public comment period, uh, you're, not, you're not part of the, the, uh, the, the discussion, um, but certainly uh, really pleased to have you here. Um, again, use the raise hand button. If you end up on the phone, you can press star nine. We'll get you in the queue. Maria put her, her uh, email in the chat. Um, if you'd like to change name, representation, that's really helpful. Pronouns, if you choose to share for folks in the audience. Um, and uh, take care of yourself. We're here till 6.30. Thank you for jumping through. And then um, quickly, I won't spend too much time uh, with the how to, how to use Zoom, but certainly the raise hand buttons on the bottom of your screen. Closed captions are enabled if that's helpful for your participation. And then um, finally, uh, just for a note for attendees, you're not able to kind of react or, or raise your hand. Thank you for rolling around and around as we go through. So finally, I'll just hit the discussion guidelines. Again, I will not spend a lot of time here. You all have been uh, really good about sharing time, balancing uh, the space, staying on topic. I'm gonna push you all to, to really stay in a, I'll give some guidance for how we're gonna have the conversation. Um, it's gonna feel high level. Um, and that's, it's meant to be. Um, so I'm gonna I'll push you in that. So it says stay on topic and and strive to honor the agenda, but I think it's gonna be striving to um, stay with the instructions from your facilitator today. Um, so I'll come back to that. Um, and then, you know, this is a substantive conversation. So, um, well, we're not uh, really asking you today to do a bunch of wordsmithing. We are asking you to think about policies and, and through a very specific environmental justice and equity lens. Um, and we'll, we'll touch more on that when we get to that part, part of the agenda. And then just a reminder about chat. So change your settings to everyone. And uh, we're not looking to have kind of side conversations with chat. Um, really do ask folks to bring your voice into the room. And with that, I'm going to pass it to Jenna. We'll skip some slides and go to project updates. Right. Hi, everyone. Uh, Jenna with Clark County. Nice to see you all again. Um, I just have a couple of project updates. Uh, first, um, for your meeting materials, I wanted to note that your meeting packet includes comments from your fellow EJC members and members of the public that we've received since your last meeting. Um, 
You may have also noticed in your meeting materials a copy of the draft resilience policies that we'll be discussing today. Um, and there are also two memo memos in there that summarize background information uh, that will help inform today's uh, an equity and environmental justice uh, lens conversation. And um, one of those memos summarizes some quantitative data we've looked at, and the other summarizes themes from the community engagement that you all have helped us do. So we'll bring some of that into the conversation, but just wanted to let you know uh, that those items are in the materials if you didn't get a chance to look at them yet. Um, also, just in case of interest to you, we did provide some background materials that are completely optional if you want to look at them or not, um, but they're there for reference. Um, one is a link to a new climate hazards and environmental health disparities dashboard that um, it shows maps you've seen before, but we now have them, the interactive versions live on the county website. Um, we also included a draft of the phase two engagement summary, which includes a report that summarizes um, key themes um, and the appendices of a lot of detailed analysis of your phase two engagement work. Um, we will wait to finalize those documents um, until everybody's completely done with all their phase two engagement. I think we're waiting on just a, a couple of more items to come through to us to wrap that up. Um, and then I guess as a heads up, our plan is to finish summarizing all your phase three and phase four engagement work as well um, as much as possible before your next meeting in December. So um, we know a few of you are still just wrapping up your final engagement items. So as soon as you're done, if you can send your uh, the feedback you heard and your progress reports to Lauren, Amy, and I, that will help us wrap, wrap all of that up. So thank you so much. Um, and then finally, in your background materials, we did also include a copy of the equity and environmental justice lens we'll be using today. Um, we, it's been a few months since we've looked at it, so we reposted it as part of your materials packet as well. Um, a couple of updates related to upcoming events. Um, just wanted to give a heads up, um, the county, we are hosting a community workshop on greenhouse gas reduction. We, we had to reschedule it, so the new date for that is Saturday, November 16th. It will be at Sarah J. Anderson Elementary School from 9 to 11 a.m. Details are on the county's project webpage. Advanced registration is requested by November 10th, and Spanish language interpretation is available upon request at registration. So please feel free to share that with people in your circles if you think they might be interested in participating. Um, and then for those of you who are interested in the broader comprehensive planning project, the Planning Commission and County Council have hearings on the comprehensive plan land use alternatives to be studied in the draft environmental impact statement. Um, so the Planning Commission's hearing is November 7th at 6.30 p.m. The County Council will have a hearing on the same topic um, at a date that has not yet been scheduled yet, but uh, we would imagine a few weeks after the Planning Commission hearing. Okay, and then if we can go to the next slide, I also just wanted to revisit the project schedule really quick to remind us all where we are. Um, so this slide you've seen before, this is the overall decision-making process for this project. And we have finally arrived at that start item today where we will begin reviewing draft policies using an equity lens and uh, where you all can help incorporate the resilience feedback that you help collect um, and that you heard through your engagement work into today's discussion. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and then uh, once you all finish reviewing um, the draft policies um, at this meeting and our December meeting, your recommendations will move forward to the CAG, which as a reminder, we have three of you who are also in that group. So part of your job is to help shepherd forward this group's recommendations. Um, and then the CAG will wrap up their final recommendation shortly after you all. Um, and then it will, the recommendations will go to the Planning Commission and then ultimately to the County Council to make their decision. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, we also looked at this slide um, at the last meeting. This is the more detailed timeline uh, of the EJC's work. And just, uh, I won't go through the whole thing, but just as a reminder, this slide is showing most of the work that um, sort of key items that you all have helped us do to date. And it's pretty exciting because we are almost done all of the engagement work. Um, just a, a few final items people are, are wrapping up. So that's pretty exciting. Um, let's go to the next slide.
All right, and then this slide is primarily showing what we have left to do. And so we've got the two items starred there on the left uh, that are our key items for today's meeting, where you all are going to start reviewing draft policies with the equity lens and start developing some recommendations. Um, and we've provided a lot of supporting information in your meeting packet and we'll incorporate into these slides as well. Um, so while you all are starting on this work, just a reminder, we do have other folks also reviewing draft policies, um, including county staff, the consultant technical team, folks from other partner agencies. So they're doing that review as well. And um, uh, the, the goal is that uh, you all um, and all these other folks who are reviewing draft policies will wrap up your recommendations in early 2025. So they can be folded into the rest of the process. Okay, I think that's my last slide here, and I'll stop there for project updates and do some more updates later on in the, in the slide. Okay, thanks, Jenna. So just any any quick questions, Rebecca, your, uh, um, your comment was uh, replied to in the chat, but any immediate questions uh, about the timeline? Great, okay, well, not seeing any, let's um, move into our resilience conversation. John, are you going to kick us off, or Dana, you want to just jump right in? I'm happy to jump in, Jenna, unless you want to. Okay. <laughs> no, let's get right into it. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Dana Hellman with Kappa Strategies, working on the resilience of elements. Nice to see you all again. It's been quite a while. So uh, just quickly here at the top of this refresher activity session, um, wanted to provide a recap on what's been happening with the resilience goal and policy development process because there's been a lot of activities since you last received an update on this back in may um, so you can see here just in this flow chart this all began in april with the cag we asked that group to brainstorm resilience goals it was a sticky note kind of exercise just throwing out any ideas that people had that they wanted to address through resilience goals and policies and then you all may remember we brought a summary of that feedback to the EJC in the May meeting and asked for any expansion, editing, comments on what came out of the CAG. And the combined input from CAG and EJC in the spring essentially turned into goal and policy list version one. Um, and I will just flag starting with those first steps and until now, uh, the project team has been keeping a document called a comment tracker. We've gotten a lot of really good ideas from both the CAG and EJC members that are maybe a little bit too detailed for policy language, but we want the county to have them handy when it comes time to do implementation. So all the time, anything that anyone has said or suggested via email is uh, retained in this comment tracker. So um, after goal and policy list version one was developed in the spring, it went through two additional rounds of review and editing with the CAG. And the purpose of those sessions was really to get some agreement from the CAG. And those of you who are on both groups would have been participants in that as well. Um, trying to get some agreement consensus from the group about what the goals and policy should address, what the comment or the content topic should be, what the language should be to some extent. And so after a couple back and forths on that, we ended up with a version three. And one of the lingering questions at that point was, can we cut any policies from this list? So we had a few more than we wanted. We were hoping to get about 35 policies. And in June, we were at a more like 40 policies. So we needed to reduce some. Um, and one thing we ended up doing is identifying with the county some opportunities to do cross-reference. So there were several policies that came out of the CAG and EJC feedback sessions that were already pretty well addressed in um, either the current comprehensive plan or other county documents. So rather than create a whole new policy for those things, uh, the county confirmed that we could do them as cross-references in the plan update. So. After all of that, we ended up where we are today, which is our goal and policy list version four. That's what you all have seen and will be commenting on today. Um, it includes 25 goals, 34 policies, and the resilience team has already done an initial pass of analysis on these, looking at criteria like cost and feasibility, um, co-benefits, unintended impacts. That's gonna continue into the next few months here. Uh, but we're about to embark on this third bullet point here, which is the equity analysis process with EJC. 
And we're hoping that you all can help us review these using your equity lens and make sure that the goal and policy, well, particularly the policy language that we're working with right now is responsive to our goals and requirements related to equity for this planning process. So with that, I will turn it over to Jenna. Thanks, Dina. We can go to the next slide. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit more recap um, of things we've done over the past several months, but just try to tie a few things together. Um, so um, just as a reminder, House Bill 1181, which is the climate change legislation we are working to implement as part of this project, established several environmental justice requirements and definitions. And in general, this legislation is emphasizing that planning and policy decisions related to climate change do not impact us all in the same way. And the legislation requires that our climate element or chapter, um, that the policies in it, benefit community members most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So on this slide, I just have some excerpts from the legislation itself. Um, so I'll just run through um, to remind you all some of the type of language in here. Um, for the new climate change and resiliency goal, it says that we need to ensure comprehensive plans advance environmental justice. Um, and there's language that says for the climate element, we must avoid creating or worsening localized climate impacts to vulnerable populations and overburdened communities. And specifically in the resilient sub-element portion, it talks about we must prioritize actions that benefit overburdened communities that will disproportionately suffer from compounding environmental impacts and will be most impacted by natural hazards due to climate change. And it also talks about that we must um, come up with goals and policies that support adaptation to climate impacts consistent with environmental justice. And this legislation also provides definitions for things like overburdening communities, environmental justice, and vulnerable populations. Okay, so that's just a refresher of some of the language in this legislation we're working to implement. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And as you may recall, the equity and environmental justice lens you all helped us create earlier this year includes three overarching questions which are listed on this slide. And I want to spend just a few minutes recapping some of the background information we all have looked at as a group um, to help answer the first two questions on the list. Um, the first being, who is most impacted by this issue or decision, positively or negatively? And what does the data tell us? Consider qualitative and quantitative data. So I'll share a little bit about that, um, you know, just recapping what we've done so far, and then we'll spend most of our discussion time with you all on that third question. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So we have four major pieces of data that have informed our resilience work so far. Um, the first are climate hazard projection maps. The second are um, examples of impacts from different climate hazards from research that Dana and her team shared with us. We also have looked at information on who is more vulnerable to impact on climate change. And then finally, we have all of the community-provided feedback that you as the EJC have helped us collect um, on how people have been impacted by severe weather in the past and feedback on possible ways to address those impacts. So let's go to the next slide, and I'll just dive into each of these a little bit uh, further just to refresh all of our memories. So um, if you might remember way back early last spring, Dina and her team shared us a series of maps, um, such as the one shown here, on various climate projections for the county. And as a result of looking through all of this information and what's expected to happen over the next couple of decades, we identified seven hazards that are expected to get worse here in Clark County over the coming decades that we would need to address as part of our resilience work. Um, so those are extreme heat, drought, wildfires, wildfire smoke, extreme precipitation, flooding, and landslides. Um, also, uh, there's a link on this slide and in your meeting materials, uh, so you can, if you want to reference anytime during the conversation today, you can pull up these maps um, for reference if that's helpful. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, you may also recall discussing the major impacts that we can expect from each of these hazards. So here's just a, an example table that Dana's team shared with us on examples of possible impacts from extreme heat. Um, so across many different sectors, you know, from agriculture and food to buildings and energy to health and well-being, there's all sorts of um, uh, 
potential impacts that we could expect to, uh, in our community. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so those few slides were around, you know, how the climate is expected to change. But we're also really interested in, well, who's most vulnerable to the impact of these changes in our climate? So the climate legislation I mentioned includes definitions of overburdened communities and vulnerable populations. And our county public health team has also conducted research on populations most impacted uh, by or more likely to be vulnerable to climate impact. And uh, the results of that research are um, off the list on this slide right here, which is consistent with the definitions provided in the state legislation. Um, and you all may recall that when you, way back when you applied to be a part of the EJC almost a year ago, uh, one of the questions in your application was, you know, we were looking for organizations who are serving uh, populations that intersect with this list. Um, and so you all do that, right? You all are working with communities um, that are uh, intersecting with at least one of the populations, if not several of the populations um, on this list. Um, and so, you know, as you know, through all of your engagement work, you are helping us collect feedback from people in our community who are more vulnerable to climate impact. Um, the map here that's shown on this slide, um, this is a copy of the Washington State Environmental Health Disparities Map. And it shows the relative environmental health of a census tract based on 19 indicators of vulnerable or overburdened populations and environmental exposures. And when you combine all these different factors, um, it provides a, a composite score for each census tract. So a higher number means a greater burden or more health disparity, and a lower score means less burden or less uh, health disparity. So in this map, a darker purple color indicates a more burdened census tract, and a lighter color indicates a less burdened census tract. Um, since the county only has planning jurisdiction in the unincorporated area, um, in this map, the cities are all, all grayed out. Um, but if you go to our online version, you can turn the city layer on or off if you are, are curious about what's going on in other parts of the county. Um, but if we look at this map in the unincorporated area, we can see that the darker purple areas are in places like Hazeldell, Minnehaha, Orchards, and just to the east of Washougal. So this environmental health disparities map, it provides general information on more and less overburdened communities in the county that are more or less likely to be negatively impacted by climate hazards, but it doesn't really show us you know, vulnerability for specific hazards, right? It's a pretty general um, data set. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, you know, one other example of how we can think about who is more vulnerable to climate impacts in our community is to consider who is more exposed or sensitive to each of the different hazards that we are interested. Um, so for example, I won't go through everything on this list, but if we just look at extreme heat at the top there, we know that people who live outside or have no air conditioning access or have certain pre-existing health conditions or dependent on electricity for life support, young children, older adults, people who work outside, or people who live in areas that have a lot of paved service, uh, surfaces and little tree canopy um, and are far from water bodies, these are all examples of people who are more likely to either be out in the heat more when it's really hot or be in a situation that's hotter um, when it's hot out than, um, than other folks or may be very sensitive to the hot weather. Um, and so we can go through each hazard and think about um, you know, who is more exposed or sensitive to each of those hazards as well. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So our fourth major data set for our resilience work comes from all the community engagement work that um, you all have been helping us with. So um, as you may recall, uh, our phase one engagement work focused on getting community member feedback on how people have been impacted by severe weather in the past here in Clark County. And our phase two engagement work focused on possible resilience actions. You know, well, what should we do about it? And um, we have been, um, as you all have been collecting feedback, we have been working on summarizing it into reports along the way. And for today's meeting, um, uh, what we did was we took uh, the feedback we have on the phase one and two engagement, um, and we tried to sort it by themes. 
and we'll talk about, we're going to talk about different um, policy groups uh, by theme, and so we've tried to sort the feedback to sort of align with those discussions that we'll be having, um, and so we'll just sort of do a quick refresher of here's some of what we heard and saw in the feedback you all helped us collect uh, before we talk about a group of policies. So we'll share that um, throughout today's conversation. All right. I am done with that now, Ben. Back to you. Yeah, thanks, John. And so, Jude, your comment, if it's a Dana response, so it was around extreme cold, which is certainly something that I think folks heard when they um, engaged with folks, but the language uh, around extreme precipitation is what was captured here. Do you want to talk to that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Um, so we decided pretty early on that we would not call out extreme cold specifically while recognizing that it is something that happens in Clark County. It's a very big issue for vulnerable populations. Uh, for this particular project, Department of Commerce tasked us with identifying climate hazards that are made worse, more intense, more frequent by climate change. And um, there's really no good source of data, no projections out there that indicate that extreme cold would be getting worse with climate change. It actually shows the opposite. So that in the coming decades, Clark County can expect to see fewer days below freezing, um, fewer days with ice and frost. So that's why extreme cold is not called out specifically. Um, I will say we've been, when we use that extreme precipitation hazard, we typically write it as extreme precipitation and storms. So again, because of what the data are showing us, we're mostly looking at rainstorms and windstorms for the future. Um, but of course, there's always a possibility of snow and ice storms. Hope that answers the question. Jude, feel free to follow up if not. Okay, thank you, Dana. And then Sunny, welcome. Do you wanna just say hello? Good to see you. Hello, sorry for being late. Good to see you all. Oh, welcome. Okay, well, Thanks, and, and and as we um, go through this conversation, if there's other questions that come up, please uh, don't hesitate um, to raise them. There's a lot of policy um, policies that we'll be, be talking about. So as we transition now into the conversation, if we go to the next slide, starting to tee up this discussion and application of the equity and environmental justice lens to the resilience policies and and, um, so I'll, I'll just kind of keep it at a high level, and then we can, um, I'll pass it to Jenna to kind of work through some of the, the, the process and background information and how this process is going to unfold, not just for today, but in relationship to um, the, the broader process that's unfolding. So if you go to the next slide, I'll say a couple of things. Someone, you know, Jenna reflected on the legislative direction. Um, you know, around prioritizing actions that, that benefit overburdened communities that would disproportionately suffer, um, ensuring that the policies um, are designed to identify and protect and enhance community resiliency in the context of today's conversation, right? So Jenna laid that out as a statutory and legislative direction. Um, fundamentally, right, policies that avoid creating or worsening, worsening localized climate impacts for vulnerable populations. That's overlaid with the maps, overburdened communities. You can see the geography, the health risk, and of course, you know, you all have been out in community um, with a with kind of a laser focus on on these populations. And so, as we think about the discussion we're going to have, we're going to look at some of the the draft policies um, and really try to do this uh, overlay of environmental justice and equity as it relates to those policies. As we have this conversation, I just want to draw some distinction between, and I know, Jenna, you're going to talk a, a little bit more about this, the high-level goals that show up in the climate element and comprehensive plan versus implementation when you execute that plan um, on the ground. And so when we say the goal is determined if they give enough direction at a high level to guide implementation, we're not going to get into the, the nitty gritty details of the how. And I know that I'm just saying that and I'm going to probably push you all to try to not go into, you know, some of it's well, it depends how it's done. Right. And I think for every single policy here, you can say, well, that sounds good, but it depends how it's done. What we want to do is does the high, does the language that you see in this policy area give enough direction for implementation? 
right? Enough direction to make sure that if, if and what, not if, when these policies are implemented, that they have the possibility to benefit or not burden um, vulnerable populations. Okay, so that it, I know that's going to be a challenge for y'all. So I'm just saying it as clear as I can, right? To try to draw some separation to getting really down into the details of what it could look like versus does this policy language itself kind of direct the work um, in a way that supports um, the communities that you all are a part of and work with and have been speaking to over the, the, the last several months. So I'm gonna just leave it there for now. And then as we have this conversation, I'll, I might ask you to kind of bring it up a level um, or I might ask us to come back to this notion of trying to stay at the high level guidance and not get into the kind of, uh, you know, implementation level details that I know are hard to, hard to stay away from. Um, but I'm just gonna try to challenge you to do that, okay? So, Jenna, do you want to talk about kind of the, the next few slides? Yes. All right. So, um, just sort of building on what Ben was saying, um, I'm just going to do a quick reminder on what does it mean if policies are in the county's new climate chapter in the comprehensive plan? So, as Ben was saying, we're you know, comprehensive plan policies are pretty high level, um, and they are serving as a guide to the county. They, you know, they're big picture, they're long term, and for the most part, specific next steps are going to be needed to implement policies once they get adopted. So a lot of those details will get figured out once uh, the county council adopts the initial policies. Um, and I've got a list here of the types of things that might happen once the policy is adopted into a comprehensive plan. So I'll just go through a couple of these. Uh, for instance, um, let's say we end up with a policy in this new chapter that has something around expanding electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Well, um, a possible next step once that policy is adopted is for the county to then work on an electric vehicle charging infrastructure plan. And that's where it gets into the, well, where are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? How are we going to fund this? All those details would get worked out as a next step. Um, another example um, uh, on this list, um, you know, some, some things are going to end up in a policy, and then the next step would be to um, revise the county's code, because the code are the actual specific local regulations that um, need to be followed when uh, Someone tries to build a house or build a road in the county. It's the regulations that actually um, are those specific local laws. Um, but that would be a next step once the policy is adopted. Um, something that does actually happen almost immediately once a policy is adopted is county capital projects. So those are things the like county builds roads and bridges and parks. Um, those types of county projects have to be consistent with the comprehensive plans, and their budgets have to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. So once a policy ends up into in the comprehensive plan, future county projects like those would need to be consistent with these with these policies. Um, and then um, two other quick examples, um, you know, some policies may lend themselves for the county running a program. Either the county's running it or they are passing money out to community organizations to run a program. Um, so again, we need the policy to pass first before um, staff can start working on designing or implementing a program. Um, and then finally, um, comprehensive plan policies sometimes can help the county access funding. So um, when we apply to, for grants from the state agencies, Sometimes there are checkboxes on, do you have a policy that does X, like reduces greenhouse gas emissions or, or something like that. And so um, some policies may potentially uh, increase the county's opportunity to access funding to do some of these things in the future. So a lot of work to come after uh, the policies, and our task right now is to help uh, come up with uh, some proposed policies to be adopted. Okay, next slide. Um, and then I was also just asked to speak about, well, how are we going to use all the feedback you're about to give to us? Um, and so our goal today as a project team is to listen to what you all have to say um, and then think about how we might take, uh, you know, your key interests um, and suggestions and 
and how, how might we reflect that in, you know, into the policies? Is it changing a policy? Is it adding a policy? Is it defining something in the background section? Um, so we, we, we try to sort through um, a good approach to address the things you raise. Um, at your December meeting, we'll then do a similar conversation using the equity lens on the greenhouse gas reduction policies. And then following it again, the project team will then take what we hear from you all and try to incorporate your suggestions into the greenhouse gas reduction policies. And then in January, we would like to come back to you all and say, okay, here's what we heard. Here's how we tried to fold it in. What do you think? So we'd like to then check back with you on um, how well we did incorporating your suggestions. Um, and also at your January meeting, we'd like to um, have a discussion on an overarching equity policy for the climate chapter. because. We are, we are thinking there's some common themes that maybe can be called out um, as a separate policy as well. Um, so while you all are helping us with this, I, I had mentioned earlier, we've also got additional policy analysis underway by our technical consultants, uh, other county staff, and, uh, and partner, agency team task, partner agency team staff. And um, we are going to take the recommended changes from you all, from these other folks, and batch them together, um, and the CAG will help us sort of sort through final recommendations in their last couple of meetings. Um, and then uh, where they land, that final recommendation is what will go to the Planning Commission and then the County Council. All right, back to you, Ben. Thank you. So, you know, um, it's kind of a, a bit of a repeat around the um, EJ and equity lens, uh, and again, just hearkening back to the legislative direction, right, that requires the policies to avoid work, creating or worsening localized climate impacts. Um, and then as we did our work together, we really landed on collaboratively these kind of three overarching um, questions um, to help support the analysis a policy concepts now in this part of the process, but I think to Jenna's point, right, in the long term, right, thinking about how you ensure that environmental justice and equity stay um, central to, to implementation, um, but trying to understand who's most impacted by that issue or, or, or decision, right? These are core questions of, of, of the lens. What does the data tell us, right? You've seen some of the, the images um, that were shared earlier, and you all know this well through the work you've done and engagement. Um, so that qualitative data, the stories, the experiences, the everyday kind of realities of people's lives. And then what are the ways, and this is really where we'll be focusing today, in which a policy re recommendation could be modified to enhance, right, lift up the positive and, and mitigate or reduce negative impacts, right? And that's kind of where we're gonna uh, really encourage you all uh, to, to focus as we, we go through our conversation today. So, you know, moving forward, if we go to the next slide, um, you know, Dana will walk us through uh, a little bit of background and kind of what we're going to be looking at and how they uh, got to the, the place of kind of looking at these policies and in, in different groupings. Um, and then we will uh, tee up a discussion and begin kind of moving through policies kind of one group at a time really with some overarching questions that we're gonna ask for your feedback on. So Dana, if you wanna describe kind of what we're gonna be looking at, why uh, it's it's shaped in the way it is. Yes, sure thing. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned before, we had 34 individual resilience policies. They're kind of all over the board in terms of content. Um, unfortunately, given our limited time together here today, it may not work to go through them one at a time. So just to try to facilitate this conversation, make it a little bit easier to talk about these through the um, EJ and equity lens, um, the project team has come up with these six groupings and each one of these, you've gotten a sneak peek of these if you've seen this in your meeting materials, but each one of these, categories has five or six resilience policies within it that are at least somewhat related. We tried our very best to make logical connections between groups of five or six. Most of them fit pretty well. Um, and the idea is to kind of make it a little bit easier to comment on the package of policies on a particular theme as opposed to having to step through each one individually. So the categories that we came up with are really based on things that we've heard come out of the EJC, that we've heard come out of the community engagement uh, work that you all have been doing. 
as sort of essential topics, key topics that are relevant to the equity conversation. And they're also grouped more or less in order from most directly relevant to equity and EJ, uh, and then you know becoming a little less so as we go down the list. So for example, you'll see some of the policies in the public health and well-being category already contain language like vulnerable populations, environmental justice. Those are really directly connected. And I think you may find also that they, they speak really clearly to some of the issues you've been hearing in your communities. Um, and then, you know, by the time we get down to natural areas and ecosystem services, perhaps those connections will not be as obvious, but um, still certainly worth talking about and seeing what we can come up with. So I will leave it there and turn it back over to Ben. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Dana. Um, and so um, if we go to the next slide, we're going to show you the questions that uh, we're going to ask you all to, to consider as we as, as Dana just laid out, kind of move through these policies and, and the groupings they're connected with. So um, for my previous comments, right, what are the ways in which these policies could be modified to enhance positive impacts or reduce negative impacts, right? So a very high level question to be applied to the policies. And how can we strengthen or adapt so they give enough direction? Again, this direction uh, language that we'll continue to use at a high level to guide implementation, right? So again, to Jenna's point, right? How do you name the guidance around electric vehicle um, adoption uh, or the increase in uh, electric vehicles without getting into, and we need a charging station in this neighborhood on this block um, because that's where people would use it, right? So how do you give enough guidance that it would kind of paint a picture for where the work needs to go, but not so explicit um, that we're getting into implementation. And again, this is a, a line we'll be dancing on, I bet, as we have this conversation. Um, and again, the focus on vulnerable populations and overburdened communities. So those are the questions. We'll put them in the chat. Um, we're going to kind of repeat it, those questions, as we go through each of these uh, different groupings. So. We're going to start with public health. I know Jenny, Jenna, Amy, who wants to give us a, some of the feedback reflection? This is Jenna. I'll, I'll keep talking. Um, so just a few reminders on some of the feedback um, that we saw um, and what you all helped us collect um, is uh, that some people, their day-to-day -day concerns are by far higher priority than specific concerns around climate change. Um, we also heard people um, have had the most issues with really hot weather, really cold weather, and smoky air in the past. And um, impacts of particular concern were to physical health, mental health, I think you all helped elevate that as a really big concern, uh, emotional and spiritual health, um, disruption to job and income, which can have all sorts of cascading effects on financial burdens, um, impacts to, and disruption to schools, child care, and transportation and access to essential services. And people seem to identify it was it was hard sometimes to stay feel safe and stay safe and comfortable when there was really extreme uh, weather going on. Um, folks also identified other day-to-day -day challenges that made coping with severe weather events more difficult. You know, things like an existing health condition or disability, um, difficulty finding shelter when um, when houseless. Um, difficulty paying for things like housing and utility bills and food. Um, and um, examples, especially with hot weather, about you know, not having a place to go that had air conditioning. Um, the feedback also helps share that you know, there are underlying economic and social systems that create different risks and trauma for different people that are then exacerbated by climate change. And then there were a lot of specific challenges that the unsheltered community helped identify as well that they um, have struggled with. Um, and then on the right side of the screen here, we have, uh, you know, we asked uh, through the phase one and phase two feedback, uh, various questions on, well, what did you need that you didn't have? Or what do you think we should do about it? Or we gave some examples and have people tell us what they thought would be helpful or not. Um, so some of what stood out from those kinds of questions was um, prioritizing assistance for vulnerable community members, enhancing access to resources, particularly for vulnerable groups, a desire to link climate adaptation strategies to social equity and public health strategies, a need to better address mental health support services, 
in climate resilience planning, more places to feel safe from extreme weather, um, and a need to figure out how to make those places feel safe um, because they may not feel safe for everyone. Um, a need for things like wellness checks, uh, better communication and alerts. Um, our unsheltered community members identified specific features that might make them want to go to a heating or police shelter, uh, better access to food and shelter for the houseless community, lower costs for everyday and ongoing expenses, and overall better community connection and care. Right, we're ready for the next slide. So there's a couple things I'll, I'll say, and so we have, you know, somewhere in the, you know, 10 minutes or so each, 10 to 15 minutes for each of these goal areas. Mm -hmm. um, so again, we, we have the questions that we put in the chat. I think one of the things you'll recognize, um, you know, pull out maybe mental health for an example, that might show up in multiple places. So what you heard, it might be connected to public health, it could be connected to some of these other pieces. So I'll ask that you hold kind of each of the learnings and reflection from the engagement. Uh, think about the multiple ways that some of these concepts might apply. So as we go through um, each of these, um, last, am I getting a, are you all hearing like a, a reverb or something? Okay. Is it still happening? Not anymore. Okay. So maybe I'll just ask folks to stay on mute and then come off mute um, uh, when you want to speak. So for the public health and well-being draft policies, as you look through these, again, could they be modified to enhance positive impacts, reduce negative impacts? How could they be strengthened or adapted to give enough direction at a high level to benefit vulnerable populations and overburdened communities, particularly in relationship to what you all have heard as you've been doing engagement? And again, to Dana's point, we're not going to kind of go one by one. I just want you to sit with it um, and seek those opportunities. How would you modify, enhance? I guess if you want to say that this one looks great, I love it, um, we'll take that too. Yeah, Gabriella. I was gonna raise my hand and then I. Uh, I saw you come off here. I got you. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Let me see if I got this right. So, do you want us to look at each one of them and, according to the questions in the chat, to give you feedback? Yeah, that sounds right. So, why don't, why don't you lead us off, and then we can talk through kind of what you um what you offer. Okay. Sorry, my phone is thingy. Um, okay, uh, well, for G15, P2, uh, the factor climate impacts into planning of operations and coordination and preparedness response. Okay, um, so as you already included, uh, vulnerable populations and, um, all the things we could possibly give you feedback on. I think that um, um, having something that says about, we're talking about climate e climate impacts and we're not using the extreme cold, is that right? So, but since we just happen to have one of those um, cold weather impacts at the beginning of the year, one of the feedbacks that I uh, got from the community was why the streets were not clean from the ice and the snow. Like it was mostly ice, but like the icing the streets or sand the streets and not only the main streets, but the, the streets that go to those main streets. You know what I'm saying? So what about something like that? Um, so it goes into the policy that uh, the streets need when there is a weather concern, 
those streets need to be prepared for the weather, for the coming up weather. Because I think that was one of the biggest things with the lack of mobility and and transportation because the streets were not clear. And since it was ice, cars were, some cars couldn't even drive on the ice. People kind of walk on the ice. They fall all over the place. So the, this is me thinking about out of the box. <laughs> No, no, Gabrielle, I appreciate that. And I, for some reason, my mind is blanking, right? So on what you call the folks that, like, do, like, street operations, <laughs> like, what, what, what is that called? And so, I, I mean, I'm seeing an overlay, right? So I know we're, we're trying to set aside a little bit, although I think, um, you know, if you think about climate impacts, cold weather and ice storms, the storms, right, to use the language mm -hmm. that we used earlier, is something that certainly you all have heard about, right? So if I was saying, you know, if I looked at what, what I'm hearing you saying is there's a missing partner around transportation and the, the mobility around a community. And you're That's describing right. it, of course, around ice treatment, but it could be fallen trees from a windstorm. It could be blah, 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 right? How do you make sure that folks can get safely around community? I'm going to look right. to my Clark County folks because I don't know, like, is there a department that transportation is that? I think it's uh, a department of transportation and also the um, electric company because when power lines fall down, also there is a risk. So it is trees falling down, power lines coming down, and also um, the thick ice or snow on the streets. Okay, so what I might offer, and if it's not, you know, you all might be seeing it somewhere else, is what I hear of utilities and transportation as named partners um, when you're thinking about operations and coordination of preparedness, response, and recovery. Okay, right. so that's, that's the high level of making sure you're naming the partners that are incorporated into the story that you shared, right? So um, it's not, we're not going to say, well, you know, as we... You know, clear ice from the streets, but making sure right. the partners right. are there. Okay, that's helpful, Gabrielle. Thank you. And, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm not. <laughs> and uh, I'll be brief. So also, um, right now, we are experiencing a high level of rain uh, sometimes. With the leaves on the trees coming down, so the, the gutters on the streets blocked up. So then there is a river of water on the streets so yep. cars will shut down so also that will be uh obviously we don't say that but the partner that will take care of that which is um i don't know the department of transportation too i don't know who does who, who takes care of that yeah well i'm going to capture as utilities and transportation now and then in our what we'll capture broadly is is kind of the stories that speak to what you're describing. Monica, jump in. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, yeah, this is Monica Zazueta. Um, So I remember a while ago when um, the ice storm hit and um, I was homeless and um, there was a church open. And this is for G15P2. Um, and uh, the church saved me. Um, and uh, they had food, a mat on the ground, you know, a bathroom, you know, and so including them in this conversation of, of responders um, um, and um, uh, also food banks, um, because I remember during COVID, I went and I did some food boxes uh, for the food banks, um, uh, but then also um, the, the ones that deliver food to uh, people that can't come out of their homes also uh, have them involved in this as well um, uh, because, uh, uh, to have them be prepared as well. So those are, those, that's what was my uh, two comments for that one. Okay, I haven't read the other. I got stuck on that one. I haven't read the rest. So yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate it. Thank you for, for naming that. And so, you know, I, what we probably want to do is avoid naming every potential partner, right, that could be listed in this. But I, what I hear, and Monica, and what you're saying is like, how do we leverage existing community assets, right, as part of this broader planning 
and recovery and response, right? So, you know, maybe that's the note that I'll capture is to ensure that there's language that really talks about community assets, whether that's faith-based institutions, whether that's food banks, whether that's community-based organizations, right? We can make a long list. Um, but I think what you're naming is like, there actually is assets, strength-based kind of assets in communities that need to be also part of the planning and activated during the, the response. Let's go, um, Anna and then Jude. Thank you. So I, I just have two things. Um, on G15 P4, where it says assess and, uh, assess and improve the adaptive cap uh, uh, capacity of people who are most vulnerable to climate exchange uh, exacerbated hazards. Um, I know uh, it says, you know, most vulnerable, but like um, I mentioned earlier in the meetings, the fact that undocumented folks already have this idea of not being able to get access. So I would love if we could also have undocumented, like like explicitly state on there, um, just so you know when we go back to our community saying, okay, this is available also for, and then we already have. See, it's right here, y'all. It we're not making it up. It's it's safe. Um, you guys are more than than okay to access this type of programming or or whatever that that is. And then my uh, my other question would be around uh, if if uh, the um, the information is it once you know once it's posted and everything um, is the information gonna be uh, translated into different languages or is it just gonna stay um, English? So, I mean, I think that's an implementation. What I would, I guess I would ask Anna for you to say if, as you read this, right? So one, if you, so I hear your, your recommendation to add undocumented. If you were to assess and improve the capacity of people most vulnerable and include undocumented, does that give you enough guidance, right? That would say, okay, in order to have it accessible um, and the ability to adapt, with that population, you would have to do it in such a way, right? So I guess I'll I'll ask that question back to you, but let's go to Jude. Anna, I'll come back to you to see, like, as you read that, if we had undocumented there, is there more guidance that would say you have to translate information? But Jude, let's come to you, and then we'll come back to Anna, and I think we have to probably move on to the next one, but if there's comments that you're holding, we can always make a note. Jude? Um, yeah, I just <clears throat> first like to reflect on what I'm appreciating what everyone is saying. And I think that if you added a couple more examples in G15 P2, you would include the community base, faith base, whatever, in terms of the overall planning that needs to happen in terms of preparedness and response and recovery activities around um, major events. That might help. Yeah, that makes and, sense. Yeah. And the, the flag that I wanted to bring in was uh, labor and industries and legislation to protect the health and well-being of outdoor workers. Uh, I'm not sure whether existing regulations are enough. So I don't know if there's a way to open this up. It's like, you know, existing and improved because I know there's been a recent major effort to get protection for farm workers. And this is very recent. So I don't know whether that has translated over into Washington from Oregon or how things are standing, but I think we need to be as protective as we can be because these are hard pieces of legislation to get through because they cost money to the uh, farms, for example. So it, there's, a, there's resistance to labor protection for workers. Uh, if we can somehow be like proactively optimistic about improvements. Yeah, so, so I wonder, and, and maybe for folks, um, I don't know if this was part of the CAG conversations, um, because I think it's a it's a good question you're you're asking, to both question and comment um, in terms of the the um, actual protection of the existing. Compliance. So I, I don't know, Jenna, from the CAG perspective or Dana, as you had these conversations, was there a reason it landed on compliance with labor and industries versus 
promoting the protection and health of well-being? Like, was there a reason that the statute, kind of the legal authority is named versus the vision of protection of the health and well-being? Does that make sense how I'm asking the question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is Jenna. Um, I, um, off the top of my head, I do know there was some, I recall some conversation with the CAG. I, I think there were some CAG members who sort of advocated to reference this existing law, but um, I think we definitely should note the, um, the feedback. And, and I think the other piece is, you know, this is citing a state law that the county actually, I mean, the county has to comply with as a county, but it's actually a state-driven thing, and employers are the ones who need to comply with it. Anyway, so I, I think there's a way to potentially reframe this as more, what can the county do, right? Because, um, anyway, so I, I, I don't want to take up too much time trying to figure out how to address the, the feedback, but I think we should think about it and, and think about how to... Um, yeah, but what we might be able to do. Okay. Well, I mean, so Jude, I hear you. I mean, so, you know, you had, you know, provide compliance and with existing and improved. So that might be kind of one one way to get there. But I, I actually think what I hear from you is more of a critique around the existing legislation and that, Jenna, to your overlay, right, that's already kind of a rule. You have to comply. Um, there's a gap to your point. Jude, in terms of how that relates to farm and farm workers in particular, um, but maybe we can just take the essence of what you're saying and saying, you know, what it really is is the promotion and protection of health and well-being of outdoor workers. Um, so we can we can kind of I don't want to wordsmith as a group, but I think your point is made, um, and I'll just ask, you know, for the folks on the CAG and for Clark County to. Um, center in on kind of do we need to call out that compliance in terms of labor and industry um, or not? Okay. And then, Anna, just before we move on, I just wanted to come back to your earlier comment. I guess, like, do you have um, around the language piece, if we were to name undocumented, right? For example, if you're going to improve the adaptive capacity, do you feel like that needs to be in there or is that really an implementation question as you read it? I, I really do think so. And again, only because there is a lot of misinformation and calling it out, naming it, I, I, I think it's an, an important piece. Um, and then, um, yeah, that's that's all I got. I, I do think it's really important. Okay. So I'll just, I'll capture it as kind of, um, you know, the, the ability to kind of name kind of language and cultural access as we think about I, th I, think one, I think one example that I can give you is when the Washington state decided to do the uh, stimulus checks for the undocumented community. They called it out specifically stimulus checks for the undocumented community. And even then we were a little bit hesitant to go through that process and, 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 and apply that there was a lot of outreach and engagement specifically um, with um, like Washington's in Fronteras and like all of those organizations that really pushed to let the community know about the fact that yes, undocumented folks can and should apply. Right, thank you. So uh, Monica and Gabriel, I see your hands up. I wanna let's introduce education. I wanna move to the next grouping, but I'll call on you first. So if you wanna do a double up, um, just to keep us keep us uh, going on. So if we can introduce uh, the education and skill building, um, we'll introduce kind of what we've heard and then the policies. And then I'll start with um, Monica and Gabriella to have that conversation. Great. Um, so this is Jenna again. I'll just do a quick recap of some of the feedback in this category. Um, and so I think at a high level, while some community members have identified that they felt well prepared for severe weather events, most people did not. And they either said, I feel somewhat prepared, not well prepared, or I am not even sure if I'm prepared or not. Um, and then in terms of suggestions we heard of um, that related to education and skill building, there was a lot of support for improved access to information and education and you know, policies that help do that. Um, youth identified the need for more education around environmental justice in schools. 
Um, there was an identified need for targeted outreach and education to help inform more vulnerable populations about climate risks and available resources and all sorts of suggestions on how to do that, like through community-based organizations, for instance. Um, a strong emphasis on a need for really good communication about emergency services and resources, including that information and outreach in multiple languages. Um, a need to listen and consult with a more vulnerable community group. Um, a need for incentives to help encourage people to take preventative action and steps. Um, better emergency planning and practice. Um, uh, a lot of interest in education and access to jobs that can help improve resilience. So in you know, sectors like land management, reforestation, building, agriculture, landscaping, tree planting, and other natural resource or food sectors. Um, uh, interest in the pri private sector innovation and market-based solutions. Um, desire for more community involvement in decision-making processes. One specific example related to that was a recommendation for a BIPOC panel to help provide input on county decisions. Um, interest in more outreach notice education on local government planning efforts. Um, a lot of interest in more opportunities and training on various you know, environmental topics and practices. Lots of suggestions around resilience hubs um, and how, you know, what, where those could be, what those could be, you know, what they would need to have, things like that. And then also just emphasis on funding all age education and outreach. All right, next slide. Awesome. Thank you, Jenna. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll call uh, Monica and Gabriella first, but before we go there, I'm just going to note, uh, based on our last conversation, that I think we can make an assumption, and you all can check me on this if, if I'm if I'm misspeaking. So for example, GAP1, I would imagine that we should just be committed to naming linguistically and culturally you know, appropriate or accessible, right? So if you're gonna say develop education, developing linguistically and culturally appropriate education programs, et cetera, right? So I think I'm hearing that in public health. I'm, I, don't, I don't know that we wanna just repeat that for everyone. I think we can hold that as an overarching comment that as we kind of do that type of engagement, outreach, education, um, and provision of services that we we just named that kind of cultural and language accessibility. Is that okay for folks? So we don't have to kind of name it every single time. Call me out if, if it's not. So let's go, Monica, and then um, Gabriella, you can take us back too. But Monica, jump in. Awesome. From the previous one, there, I just wanted to uh, agree with Anna. Um, on uh, it needing to be in there for the undocumented. I mean, uh, what we choose to like put in and leave out like shapes the whole thing. Um, and so we need to be seen. Like we've been here. Hispanic undocumented people have been here, um, and but we're just not noticed <laughs> or, or you know like or whatever. And one day I hope um, you know it's not we're not undocumented or people are not called undocumented anymore. Um, but I, I agree with Anna. We need to have it in there so that we're seen. That people are seen. Um, also, I think there was a missing S on event uh, events for one of the ones past slides. Yes, uh, you saw, um, <laughs> Jenna. Um, and so um, for the education spot, um, I heard Jenna say uh, BIPOC panels. I want to add before that paid BIPOC panels, uh, panels because um, uh, the way we're living right now, I, it's scraping by, scraping by, and you know, uh, giving input like needs to their time needs to be paid. Um, also with citizens assemblies. Um, I don't know if you, and, uh, you all have heard about it, but it's where um, people are chosen by random in a lottery, uh, community members, and they come together and they learn about the topic at hand, and then they make recommendations after they've learned about the topic at hand. And so citizens assemblies or something where it's like, you know what, you live in this community, then you've got to join and freaking tell me what you think about it. <laughs> so and you, get, and you get to learn with us and see uh, other people's perspectives. So those are my comments. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Monica. Gabriella, did you want to add something? I know we moved to education, but yeah, jump in. Yeah, so I um, I agree with what um, everybody has shared, and I believe that saying um, undocumented and refugees, uh, it needs to have both because there are actually two different uh, parts of that. So and everything you said about culture specific and uh, yes, so I agree with that. 
and it doesn't have to say it in all of them, just with one of them, and that will trickle down to, to the rest. Great, thank you. Thank you. Other comments here. I know we have some folks in the in the education space. Um, I don't know for like Abby, Yolanda, others that uh, some of you working with you. I mean, I know this has been. Uh, I guess I'm just curious if if you're seeing anything here that. Feels like it needs addition. Yeah, Yolanda, please. I was trying to come off mute earlier, and I'm, I'm calling in from my phone, so I'm looking at this tiny screen. <laughs> um, let me turn my phone this way. Okay, so on the second line, G nine P one. If I'm, we're yep. still looking at that one, right? You sure are. Okay. You're in the right space. Okay. <laughs> okay. It says collaborate with tribal partners and culturally specific groups to identify important sites and resources and to develop culturally appropriate climate adaptation, community education, and emergency response strategies. What I would ask to be added to this particular line item, when we talk about tribal partners, we often leave off and 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 it's no it's not pointing the finger or anything like that everyone but we leave off the importance of recognizing tribal sovereignty and that is one thing within my whole health health equity educational space we are wrapping our arms around there's one thing to partner with tribal partners but are we fully respecting and recognizing tribal sovereignty and I'm not sure if there's anyone on this call who um, identify as AIAN, American Indian, Alaskan Native. Um, they can tell you better than I can what tribal sovereignty is and why it should always be respected. They have their own government and way of living. So when we go in to partner with other cultures, ethnicities, um, we need to understand their indigenous, beautiful background, the way they've they've learned and the way they continue to deploy not just health equity but equity across the board so we need some type of language i believe that speaks to tribal sovereignty and if we need to do a little bit more research let me know you guys can pay me for that I'm kidding um but uh we we do need to capture that uh, a lot of times we mention oh we're going to partner with this community we're going to we're going to do this and we leave out respecting the community. That yeah. is, that is um, deal that we do that. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for, for naming that so explicitly. So there's maybe a couple pieces. So maybe one is just asking kind of, you know, trying to get a little bit of sense of when this was written, what it was meant by tribal partners, right? So um, to Yolanda's point, right? So you, you generally wouldn't say collaborate, you'd say consult um, with with sovereign nations or with with um, with tribes or um, and collaborate with culturally specific groups, right? So you'd use different language that recognizes, to your point, Yolanda, the sovereign to sovereign relationship between uh, between governments. So yes. I guess like for the team. When they said tribal partners, were those native service native serving organizations, or were those actually like recognized tribes, like federally recognized or or state identified tribes? So I think so. Anyways, if there's a little bit of context, that could be helpful. But I think your broader your broader comment is is heard, uh, Yolanda. Yeah. Um, the distinction between kind of collaboration, you don't engage with. Right. So you can. Yes. Um, as government to government relationships. Right. And we and thank you so much. We we also have to be cognizant that within the state of Washington, there's 29 federally recognized tribes. Yeah. We serve or Washington make up what is it, 39 counties. But here in the state of Washington, there are 29 federally recognized tribes. So anytime we're using any type of language 
or iteration, um, when we're talking about tribes, we need to just be respectful that there is uh, tribal sovereignty. We need to always respect that. So I'll stop there. No, thank you. No, Yolanda, that's, that's a really good point and a really important one. And, you know, it's also a lowercase t. That, so there's probably some background work we need to do about what was uh, being explicit about what we're trying to name. Abby, jump in, please. Yeah, I just wanted to um, clarify, this is like a kind of a little thing, but on um, G16P1 about doing a notification alerts to mitigate risk, um, I just wanted to maybe suggest some specific language that the notification um, would be on different platforms, like to encompass people who might not have um, comfortability with technology or um, not have a phone. Um, I'm assuming they mean notification alerts to also mean like postings in the mailbox and that sort of thing, but maybe just some more specific language to like specify that um, they mean to notify the community on various platforms. And then the other one was just kind of a question. I was wondering if somebody could kind of clarify G18P1. I've kind of just read it a few times and I'm kind of having a hard time understanding exactly what it's trying to cover or what exactly it's saying. <laughs> I don't know yeah, if Let's call on uh, Dana to, to describe what a resilience hub is. Is that fair, Dana? Put you on the spot? Yes. Sorry, couldn't find my unmute button. I'm also just pulling up the original goal. Some of these, I think, are a little bit easier if, if we have like the goal language. So just for starters, um, Abby, I'll read the goal 18 that this goes with, which is establish regular and or emergency centers where locals can access resources, a safe space and supportive services, reconnect with others and build skills during and after an extreme weather event or emergency. So that's the broader goal. And then the resilience hub is sort of the implementable uh, you know, strategy for that. So resilience hubs can take different forms, but they're typically um, usually a large building, doesn't have to be that large, but some kind of community center or gathering space that's specifically designated as a place where people can go um, kind of at a minimum during an emergency, but also there's kind of a, it's becoming more popular to have resilience hubs that operate all year round so that at any time of year, people can go and charge their phone or, you know, maybe charge their electric vehicle, um, get some food and water, get some training. The resilience hubs that are kind of in, in vogue right now are typically offering all sorts of skill building classes, cooking, computer skills, job training in various fields, um, stuff like that. I mean, I, I th they can take a lot of forms, but it's really about just kind of a central location where people can connect with each other and information. That's great. Yeah. yeah, sometimes I'll just sorry, one additional thought, sometimes very directly related to climate resilience, but it's more about kind of addressing day to day uh, needs and concerns as well. Yeah, okay. that's good. That makes then, sense. Oh. I want I think I just got caught up on the reduced carbon pollution aspect. I think is that just trying to say that the space would be eco friendly in and of itself? So it fits neatly into a climate element and not an earthquake earthquake preparedness or yeah, Dana, that, that last line, I think maybe Abby, that's what you're calling out. Yes, that last that last little line about and reduce carbon pollution. I think that's just what I got caught up on, but that's okay. I understand the larger concept. It sounds good. Okay. Yeah, I guess one of the things with these two is they tend to be powered with renewables and have backup uh, renewable energy systems in case of power outages. So that's that carbon piece. Got right. it. Thank you. Min, are you going to jump in? Yeah, I was just looking for some of the uh, goal that uh, one of the things we are working on, and we basically teaching skill um, to kids and computer skills, different um, skills. And was just, we've been such a program, it's been, it been growing and working. And so I was just looking for if, if some of the policies actually kind of enable us to continue this, uh, kind of like, you know, good work and develop uh, you know, being, teaching the skills to younger, uh, the youth in the community and uh, any of these policy that, you know, I'm not sure about the, the develop uh, education program. Um, any of that is actually enabled some of the program that we, we, uh, we you know, spend years to work with the, the, the youth in the community and building the, the um, you know, the infrastructure with, with our group. But, quick talent to trying to do it on our sale and 
a warning if some of this policy to actually, um, you know, uh, the county can actually study some of this and 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 somehow somehow some way enable it to continue this for a long term. And I think it benefit to this, you know, all the policy we're working on here. So, um, yeah, I wonder. If I wonder, man, if that falls into G10 P1 a little bit. I mean, I don't know if you describe that as greed jobs, but um, I, I wonder if there's a a, a place there um, in terms of like how do you build capacity that, that focus on job community. You know, that last line of G10 P1 fo focus on job creation within communities most impacted by climate hazards. Um, whether that lends itself or not, I don't know if you're seeing it in there. Or not? G one P G ten P one. Yeah, that third line, kind of the last sentence, but maybe. Uh, yeah, I think it's probably that more like for elder, for like more like for youth. Uh, okay. So it, it, and maybe that's you know really making sure that youth as a specific population is is called out in in kind of education and skill building. Um, I do want to move us, but I'm gonna so just going to do the same thing did last time, Monica and Anna. I'm going to come back to you. I do want to move us into the the next section. Um, so we at least introduce it, then we'll take a break, and then we'll keep going. But um, you want to. Hit the start the housing and energy example, and then uh, we'll go Monica, Anna, and then other comments on housing. All right. Um, so some of the impacts uh, people have experienced in the past related to severe weather and related to housing and energy included, um, again, you know, struggling to stay safe and com comfortable in extreme weather, higher energy bills, power outages, down trees, and damage to property. Um, people noted, you know, the expenses like air conditioning or repairing property um, made other financial burdens more difficult. Uh, they identified other day-to-day -day challenges that can make it more difficult to cope with severe weather. So, uh, you know, for the houseless community, difficulty finding shelter. Um, other folks had, you know, difficulty paying for housing or energy bills, particularly for heat or, or air conditioning when you do have severe weather um, or lack of air conditioning where they live or work. Um, and some specific examples that came up uh, from the community was the inability to install heating or cooling in some rented spaces. And when that is an option, installing or running better heating and cooling options may be cost prohibitive. Um, and then when we asked about you know, what, what people needed or they didn't have or what we could do to improve resilience, there was strong support for ideas focused on increasing resilience of infrastructure, so including things like energy infrastructure. Um, some EJC engagement events highlighted strong interest in goals related to affordable housing or home maintenance and rehabilitation support. Um, some youth identified the need for having adequate heating and cooling systems in all homes. Um, a lot of people mentioned you know, access to air conditioning, air purifiers, or more effective windows and insulation, either at home, their work, or school. Um, an interest in having lower cost energy bills. Um, for people who are struggling with housing insecurity, they self-identified a desire for more shelters like tiny homes to assist with um, that transition out of housing instability. Um, also, a need for services to prevent eviction during severe weather, like we saw during COVID. And there was also an interest in eco-friendly housing. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, um, let's shift to the housing and energy draft policies. And hopefully, y'all are getting expert in this. So while you're absorbing that, um, Monica and Anna, I wanted to come back to you from the previous conversation. Um, so, um, with that, well, one of it was the uh, de uh, develop resiliency hubs. Um, um, with this, I also wanted the resiliency hubs to have um, places where you could come and learn how to take part in in meetings and 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 reach out to organizations. And so, it would be a hub where organizations can come and and either uh, also use the space. But um, you know, leave their leave their cards or whatever brochures to uh, 
communicate with the public on how they can get more involved. But then also um, with um, with the kiddos, it's like we need to have this resilience hub to be fun also, and like maybe having like a little like um, uh, soccer field or a um, what is it called a garden, you know, something that is going to teach them and, and or their bodies moving and stuff like that. Um, and so. Um, uh, yeah, I just wanted a little bit more of like this is coming uh, like together as a community to, to learn together in, in language there. Um, but with the um, housing thing, um, I wanted to um, real quick. Well, not real quick. It's there's this um, uh, podcast, The Great Simplification, listen to all the time. There's uh, this uh, newest episode. Uh, is it called The Stewardship, Responsibility, and Designing a New System with NG uh, Johar. Um, it says, Indy Johar describes his journey from an architect to a broader focus on social change and addressing systemic issues. He emphasizes the importance of understanding the underlying dark matter, the institutional structures, norms, and mechanisms that shape our reality. A central theme is that, uh, the uh, a central theme is the idea that what we design designs us back. Our physical, social, and economic systems profoundly shape how we perceive ourselves and the world. Johan argues we need to reimagine our fundamental relationship to the planet and each other, moving away from individualism and ownership towards interdependence and stewardship. Practical examples discussed including rethinking food systems, transportation, housing, and material economies to be more sustainable and equitable. Johar sees opportunities for transformation in crises, constraints, and the fissures where different worldviews collide, like in indigenous land rights. Overall, Johar emphasizes the need for a revolution in how we imagine ourselves as humans, shifting from being beings to becomings in relationship with the rest of the living world. He sees this as a fundamental challenge and invitation of our time. So shifting from that, but with that, my husband passed away on um, September uh, 6th. Um, and I um, shook my whole world, it ripped my soul. Um, it, it was, uh, it's, this is the worst time my life right now um and i with the help of the community i was able to stay in my duplex that's it i my whole world just, just was taken away from me and i have the kids thank goodness but there's a thing called life happens right there's death there's there's emotional trauma and i wouldn't i, I don't know where i'd be if it wasn't help from the community helping me financially and um, now i have to move out because i can't afford my place anymore and I have to find a, a home uh, for my family and I on a, a single income um, and it's really freaking hard um, and so I just feel that we need to remember that we are human beings experiencing this life and we need to care about each other and I got the help of the community because I'm so active in the community but what about other people that aren't and that are struggling so I want like I really want to have this paradigm shift of how we, we can't keep on building the structures on structures that are not getting the job done. They're, they're just uh, exacerbating this um, uh, predatory capitalism. And so um, I just want to make sure that we, we, we are the creators of our reality. And so I want our reality to actually have this caring capacity for each other. So thank you. Well, thank you, Monica. And, and certainly, you know, building off Ilana's comments, I appreciate you sharing, but also, you know, expressing our collective condolences and, you know, for that profound loss. Um, but also what I hear in, in what you're saying, right, is that these resilience hubs, and maybe Ben, it goes back to what you're describing as well, is really imagining these spaces that are building skills and knowledge, but also building connection and relationship and some of that mutuality um, and reciprocity that, that, and can really occur when we bring folks together in these meaningful spaces and meaningful ways. So thanks for, for naming that. And putting and that word in there. What's that? Sorry, putting the word reciprocity in there, in that language too. That would okay. be great. Yeah, thanks, yeah, for thank you. thanks for sharing. Thank you. And then Anna, I wanted to come back to you and then I'm gonna ask folks to, to focus in on the, the housing one, but Anna, you had had your hand up earlier around education. Yes, um, you know, it's specifically for um, the hub um, and, and um, because it is going to be uh, essentially used as a as a communication or somewhere where people can go and get 
um, resources and education around whatever is happening. One thing that I that I, again, it's all about wording, um, and I, I I think that using you know wording around um, and information will be also available in I don't know whatever are the top languages in Clark County. Um, one of the things that we encounter a lot um, as a as a Latinx serving organization is when we get um, flyers, you know, to 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 share around with specifically with the Latino community. A lot of the times, it's more so of an art afterthought of getting that that flyer translated in, 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 into Spanish. And I don't want to make it a thing of like, oh, it's just Spanish because yes, we are the second largest language spoken in the United States, but we're not the only ones, right? Like we have a huge Pacific Islander population also here in, in, Clark, uh, in Clark County. And so I, I want to be very intentional in, in, in wording it that way of like, it will be provided in, I don't know how many languages um, and, and, and really make it a point to not be an afterthought and to, and to really do, um, yeah, just, just be very committed into sharing information in more than just English and Spanish. Yeah, thanks for that. And, and again, I mean, I think that's um, going to be a consistent naming, right? How do we think about accessibility to these resilience hubs, whether that's through language, whether that's through disability, whether that's through culturally um, accessible, just ensuring that um, there's enough direction there and naming it, right, that if you were to implement, then you have enough guidance. So I appreciate you naming it. So let's, let's um, I'm gonna recenter us in on housing and then we're gonna take a break and then we got a few more to work through. Um, but as you look at, and, and as, as Dana implied earlier, right, they've kind of gone in the order of kind of what folks heard. Um, so it's not surprising. There's a lot of energy and, and um, passion around the, the language here and uh, certainly reflective of what you all heard. So as you've absorbed some of these housing and energy policies, um, what's coming up for you? Hi, Ben. Yep, so, Gabriela. Gabriela. Yeah, um, I think it needs to be said, uh, keeping uh, low cost because um, that's essential to everybody. And we are talking about vulnerable communities. So um, we're looking at, so I'm reading, uh, <laughs> I'm, 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 so I'm thinking of, of the work with the EGC and now like reading things here. It's like, I think it needs to be said to keep uh, um, not only support energy choice, but also low cost to vulnerable communities because I think it's essential. And not only energy, well, not only electricity, but any other forms of power because we know that electricity is not the only one like we see here like natural gas geothermal all, all that stuff but maintaining a um, reasonable or low cost yeah um, I, I, thanks for naming that Gabriel. i was you know i was thinking about some of the themes that you all have named you know an economy economics financial fiscal has been one of those things that's come up um um, over and over again. So the idea of energy choice, but ensuring that there's a cost element or affordability element um, connected to that energy choice is really important. So thanks for, for naming it. Thank you. What are your thoughts on kind of housing, energy draft? And again, maybe I'll, I'll reflect back to you hearing some of the fiscal pieces, geography pieces, and then um, population pieces are things that have been themes in our conversation. So that might be one filter in which you're you're looking through this. Um, Monica. G6, uh, P1, sorry, Monica Zazueta. I was reading through it and I see renewable natural gas 
and natural renewable natural gas is, is, is retrieved by fracking. Um, and fracking is not um, uh, good for the environment. And so I'm just concerned when I see that. All right. So, uh, there might be a point of clarity. I, th I think renewable natural <laughs> gas refers to like the gas that comes from cop composting, but who's the expert here, right? Because there's a fracking gas, which is, I think it's fossil natural gas. I don't know what to write. I might be using the wrong language here. Dana, are you, the, are you the expert that can talk about what do we mean when we say renewable natural gas versus kind of the gas that's coming through uh, processes like fracking? Yeah, I think Tracy, if she's still on, might be. Oh, see, Tracy, I'm looking at one of the one of our friends in red. Um, so, uh, Tracy, uh, renewable natural gas would specifically not be from fracking activities. It would be more like from capturing the methane that is produced in landfills, or maybe um, as a byproduct of wastewater treatment, um, as some examples of sources of renewable natural gas. So it's generally something that is another process and reducing, collecting emissions from another process in order to create a byproduct that is yep. usable. Is that helpful? So that, I would love for that to be in the language though, because this one is confusing and scary to me. <laughs> I yes. want to make sure that we're not doing the other one. Yeah, so that might just be a note. Yeah, I'll, I'll have it there, Monica. There that um, Washington has specific definitions for natural gas could be rely on those um, definitions established by the state. Yeah, that sounds great. And Monica, I only know that because I was reading some articles around renewable natural, ga natural uh, gas. There was a separate conversation that I will not comment on other than that's the only reason I actually knew that. Um, and then, uh, Jude, I see your comment um, around bridge finance, shelter and housing, easier access to subsidize. Do you want to speak to what you're or where it fits. Well, affordability is a lot of different things and low income is, you know, housing is a lot, another different thing, but I know that it's very rigorous to get any kind of subsidy. It's like going for food stamps, you know, it's very, very challenging and it's not accessible to everyone. So if there's another way to build the bridges that people need to housing, interim housing or staying in your house or whatever kind of things that, you know, Monica's example kind of raises to the forefront for us. Yeah, I appreciate that. And so if I think about like G26P1, what I hear what you're saying, and maybe it's still policies, codes, maybe it's practices as well, right? So, um, it's kind of adding a layer to kind of the mechanisms to get to safe, affordable, um, stable housing. Uh, there's a way to describe it, right? So to, uh, hearing a gap there um, in terms of how, how you actually navigate to get to that result, um, and maybe there's some language we can um, have that's more, more clear um, that provides some of that direction. Thank you. Thank you. Monica, you want to come back in and then I'm going to ask us to take a break. If uh, if there's if there's someone I haven't heard, Monica, you go. And then if there's anybody who hasn't offered anything, I want to um, just pause and see if uh, there's things coming up on any of these that we've already covered. Then we'll take a break and move through our other ones. Monica, jump in. Thank you. Yes, there is a gap. And it's uh, and I I don't like the affordable housing because that would just you said it, it means so many things to so many different people and it I, there's not there's not affordable housing right now um, and for me it's like when you take from Mother Earth you need to give back to Mother Earth make the home and then um, uh, build, uh, uh, pay the labor uh, pay the uh, people that build it but then after you're done paying all that like in the rent spot of like you know taking from Mother Earth giving back to her and then pay, paying the builders and everything in the company, then it should be done. Shouldn't we be supporting each other and finding a forever home for each other and, and keeping that home, uh, the upkeep of the home good and everything and learning even, how to, learning even how to build the home with the builders. Like we need to think outside of this box that we've been placed into that we need to stay in this rent uh, prison for life. Like I don't, I don't, Mother Nature never asked for rent and so it's like we need to have different systems 
to actually say, we care about you and we don't want to take all your money every month. Um, and so we want, we want actually you to thrive and not have to worry about rent every single day and, you know, and, and do something else because everyone's worried about rent and they're not coming in to make public comment or they're not going planting trees. Like they're too tired because they're running themselves ragged over rent and food prices. So there needs to be a different way to do this. And so that's why we're here. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. So before we take a break, I know we've worked now through three different goal areas. Um, I just wanted to offer if there's anything coming up for folks who haven't shared yet, um, we'll have to just invite you in if there's anything coming up for you. Otherwise, we'll take a break. And uh, we got a few more of these goal areas to work through. And again, we can always go back. So if, if, uh, if you want to use a couple minutes of your break to think through what you've heard or what you might add, that's great too. But I'd love to just invite anyone we haven't heard from. If there's anything else. It's not a force you in, it's an invite in. So, um, you know, feel free. Uh, do want to make sure that, you know, there's a lot of expertise around the room. Um, so making sure we we have some of that. And then I see your comment, um, Habitat for Humanity, Community Roots, Collaborative Housing Developments. Um, you know, June, maybe as we go to break, if you want to think about is there a place where that um, fits, whether it's, you know, part of the policies, codes, regulations, whether it's expanding access and utilization of community land trust models and others, maybe there's something there that um, becomes part of a, a policy modification. So with that, um, team, help me do the math on time. If we take 10 minutes, does that still leave us? We got three more to go through, right? 10.35, that'll put us at like 6.15, 6 times 6.15. Yeah, let's take 10 minutes and then um, we'll come back and work through the, the last three. Does that work? Okay. Come back at 5.35.
All right, I've lost track of time, people. Uh, you got an extra four minutes of break, so I guess that's uh, we'll complain uh, complain about that. Um, should we keep moving, folks? Ready? You got your extra four minutes. A couple stretches, some jumping jacks. Okay, so we're going to move into uh, food and agriculture. Um, John, you want to provide a little background mm -hmm. on that? Um, so some specific challenges identified for the food system included impacts to food production, like damage to food crops, food access and food security, like difficulty getting or paying for food, um, the vulnerability of farmers and farming to extreme weather events, and farmers not feeling prepared for the projected changing climate. And then in terms of what people identified that we needed or what um, they thought about possible ways to improve resilience, um, we heard a lot of um, ideas. There was strong support for ideas focused on food security and affordability. Um, and then other specific ideas, like a need for more options to provide refuge for livestock if they need to be evacuated, a need for more robust food distribution system, interest in reducing sprawl, interest in food bearing trees and programs in neighborhoods, better access to crop protection and food storage in extreme weather, there were a lot of suggestions on what the county could help incentivize or fund to support agriculture and food system related ideas, um, uh, an interest in addressing issues with permit costs and requirements, issues um, help addressing access and affordability of agricultural land with things like changing tax rules, recommendations related to agricultural land preservation programs such as transfer development right programs, uh, recommendations on having a coordinated approach to agriculture and food system initiatives in the county, such as through an equity-driven agriculture commission, um, recommendations to, incur, uh, excuse me, to ensure agricultural food system policies consider environmental justice, diversity, inclusion, social economic well-being, and food security issues, such as through expansion, expansion of local food security and food assistance programs and pursuing county rights to food policies. Uh, recommendations for the county and its partner agencies to establish equitable access to programs for frontline communities, farmers, and farm workers, a need to ensure there's a resilient local agricultural economy, support from our jobs in uh, land management, reforestation, agriculture, um, and other natural resource and food system sectors, um, and support for the specific uh, workforce development and education uh, to help with those uh, those in the sector as well. And then also recommendations related to water storage, management and conservation, uh, interest and focus on support for small farms, and interest in reduction in pesticide use. Right. Thank you, Jenna. Uh, well, let's open it up. So if we go to the next slide on the food and agriculture draft policies, let you absorb those. Again, the same questions, uh, modified, Increase uh, positive impacts, reduce negative, give enough direction at a high level, et cetera. Hi, Wayne. This is Gabriela. Yep, Gabriela. In uh, G3P1, um, so it's talking about the limited use of pesticides. Um, that's very liberal way to say um, how much they can use. You know what I'm saying? So... Could there be something more specific about the use of pesticides they use? I mm. don't know. I mean, what do you have a suggestion? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, so I, I mean, I, like, I, yeah, jump in. So, um, so I think uh, the big elephant 
uh, in there is Monsanto, um, the use of um, those, those products is so harmful to humans. So I think it needs to be, I think it needs to be said um, to, yeah, not to use Monsanto, just call it out, you know, or, um, or anything that um, causes a uh, health hazard for farmers or people that work in the land. So, thank you, Gabrielle. So, I guess a couple pieces. So, there's there's one that's you know limited use versus the elimination of pesticides, which um, it's not my job to comment one way or the other on on. Right. In the language, but I, I guess I'm hearing two things, right? Because because there's kind of the production of food, right? Affordable foods that can be sustainably produced under future climate predictions, um, and then I also heard you talking about the exposure to pesticides. I guess broad term, right? Uh, pesticides right. Um, to workers, right? Which is um, is kind of not included in that definition. So um, I'm hearing a potential, right? Um, you know, that's sustainably produced. I don't know if there's a, a way to describe, um, you know, that 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 also talks about the, the workers um, exposure. And then I guess, you know, I'm curious, folks that are around the CAG, uh, Dana, Tracy, is Kelly, or, or Jenna, as you heard these conversations, did you all talk about that last line, in terms of limit, reduce, eliminate. And, and uh, for this, is, I'm just going to say that if we look at the community in Yakima and all the health issues they're having um, due to pesticides and also people that are in, uh, uh, further up north of the state, with the apple industry so it's the same thing so i think uh, we need to look at that and avoid all those health issues for uh, vulnerable communities uh no, yeah Gabriel, I, get, I get what you're laying down um i guess I'm, I'm just curious around like what's the conversation the policy conversation that got to the language on the page is there any insight for this group, because what I hear you, Gabrielle, is, is like the elimination of pesticides, right, in the production of food, both for kind of environmental and human health impacts. I guess I'm just, if there's any insights or um, reflection around why that language exists in the way that it does. I can say, I, I don't recall specifically, I, I think I recall that we had some back and forth about no pesticides versus limited use. Um, one of the arguments maybe in favor of having this in is that, um, particularly with climate change and new pests coming on the scene, it might be difficult to keep food access affordable without using some pesticides. I think that came up in the CAG, although I may be misremembering. So just putting that out there as... Maybe, I don't know if Tracy, Jenna, or others remember that conversation at all. Well, I mean, I think there's a, there's a, oh, sorry, Jenna, go on. I mean, I, the only other piece that I'm remembering off the top of my head is, I, I do think we had a different term in there, like integrated pest management or something, but, and we did get the feedback that was way too jargony and people didn't know what that meant, which is generally a, an approach of you, Seek an approach that uses the least harm, but it, you know, if you absolutely needed to, kind of, it's like a last resort. Um, anyway, so the, there was some words missing there, but I think um, I think we can definitely think about the feedback and and some other options for for wording so that the emphasis is on eliminate eliminate or or anyway. That, uh, you think about okay. I appreciate that kind of pragmatism of. of, of Kind of recognizing that new pests might be introduced, and like you know, maybe maybe we focus on kind of the health impacts considerations, right? Um, and that might be one way to to to, to kind of split the difference. Um, Abby, and then Monica. 
Yeah, I had a comment about um, G3P2 um, taking steps pre to preserve existing land by supporting the infrastructure that keeps agriculture industry viable. That feels to me like it's getting at reducing urban and suburban sprawl, but it's not explicitly naming it. Um, like I feel like just saying like prioritizing keeping that land as a priority by just encouraging more farmland I feel like I would personally rather see it say something that's a little more explicit like to explicitly prioritize keeping farmland as farmland or something more direct that gets at preventing some of that urban and suburban sprawl I guess I'm just thinking about the area that I'm most familiar with like North County La Center and Ridgefield where that is just such a massive issue where every little bit of farmland wants to be eaten up by developers um so I felt like that's what that question was getting at, but it just feels a little bit like beating around the bush to me, so to speak. I don't know if anybody else feels that way. Well, I certainly hear what you're saying, right? So there's an explicit naming of kind of pr prioritizing the protection of, of, um, of farmland. And my sense is this is getting more to things like water access, soil quality, but um, again, I'm not the expert, so can we contextualize G3P2 in the in terms of the meeting? Because what Abby's suggesting is, you know, we got to protect the, the 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 land from kind of urbanization. Um, this reads education, research, and technology, which maybe suggests something else was met. So, Dana, I'm going to look at you. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I want to go back and look at what this originally said. I will say I know this particular policy was one that we had a difficult time reaching consensus on in the CAG, and this particular language was provided by a couple of CAG members who were disagreeing, and this was the kind of consensus that they came to, and then the rest of the CAG um, heard this language and agreed to it. So I am not quite remembering what the original wording was, so I can pull that up now unless Jenna or somebody else has that handy. Okay, but Abby, your point is is separate and notwithstanding is that we, we want to be explicit about kind of protecting um, farmland as uh, from urban sprawl. If that's the way to, to yes. reflect on. I think, I think my thought was that if I'm interpreting that question correctly, which I read it as like that's what it's trying to get at, but it doesn't explicitly say it, and so it almost felt like by not specifically naming urban sprawl, it was like I immediately thought it was like a little way for developers to get in there without a lot of going against the planning that could also be me not fully understanding the comprehensive planning process all the way but i just didn't know if naming it more explicitly was um something that could be beneficial okay thanks abby monica um so um i um have talked to a farmer about why they have not gone all organic um, they said it's just too expensive, can't do it, you know, and besides, I'm and using them like they're telling me to do on the label and everything um, from what, you know, the the, the FDA or whatever is, is saying that I can. And I'm like, but the thing is, I'm like, pesticides run off. It, whatever we give to our Mother Earth, it's running off somewhere else. It doesn't just go away. And so it's it's causing problems downstream and locally. And it's just, it, you know, we eat it, 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 it's going into the water, it's, 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 it's it's causing more of the climate change, the thing that we're trying to, you know, uh, make sure we're not we're not going into a place where we're not going to survive. And there's a website called AskNature.org, where they actually um, come together and learn from um, uh, Mother Earth's uh, genius. And so they have natural pesticides uh, 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 thing to to put onto your crops so that they you're not using the pesticide ones. Like they have natural solutions. Uh, that come from the answers come from mother earth and so there is another way besides using pesticides like we just need to get away from them like if if people are allowed to do them and say oh it's because someone said i could they're going to use it even though it, it isn't good for us um and so another one um was that um we um it was the uh, g2p1 um support food producing gardens at homes and apartments like if we had actually like um Spaces of like areas of homes where they produce a certain kind of food, or in another neighborhood produce a certain kind of food, and we all like shared and swapped with each other. That would be really cool. Um, and also, uh, gro uh, grocery store garden tops uh, to put uh, gardens on top of grocery stores. Uh, they have uh, done it in Canada. 
um, and it is working out for them. Um, and then also, um, uh, if you put trees in, in your farms, they actually help with the water um, in there. Like it, it helps support the farm better. And so by putting like trees, you know, randomly and uh, biodiverse uh, your, your farm, it's actually going to help um, with the water supply. And so um, those were my, oh yeah. And then um, having um, local, uh, uh, having uh, even um, schools produce food and, um, and, 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 and sell it or something to the uh, restaurants. Um, that would also be something that um, would be cool for the kiddos to learn too. So yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. So before we um, move on, Jude, I see your, your comments. So the recommendation um, building off Abby's uh, uh, notes were kind of it separates into two policies. Do you want to give a little life to your, your kind of most proximate to uh, kind of the food and agriculture? Um, so I wanted to give you a little space. Oh, yeah, just I appreciate, you know, someone calling that out because it's really a big issue whatever exists in terms of policies and practices is not adequate because of the we see the turnover and it is in other places there really isn't a synthesized like agriculture element <laughs> but we have the climate element we have the land use element and there's a couple of things on here that actually mix i mean that's one I understand that the CAG is trying to consolidate policies because of the goal of limiting the number of them. And so I don't know what the solution to that is, um, but that that's one that does. And I think that the, you know, one of the things that needs to happen is to prioritize these, more soft skills, education, research, and technology that improve economic viability. But if we don't have the farms and the farmland and the farmers, then we, you know, we can educate ourselves into gardening. And that brings up the my comment on G2P1. Mm -hmm. So I think there's two different issues in there too, like support food producing gardens. I'm not sure how that or even what relocation of food distribution nodes is, but that sounds more like access point, like food pantries and food producing gardens sounds like a whole different separate like thing to do. Both are great, <laughs> but I don't understand first sentence. Yeah, can we unpack that? I mean, thanks, Jim, because it, it almost reads like three different things, right? So there's food, well, I don't know what a food distribution node is, um, so I, maybe team before we move on, because G2P1 does feel like there's several things kind of thrown in. There's kind of food distribution in heritage prone areas. But what's a food, well, what, let me ask the question. So Dana, what's a food per distribution node? And G2P1. Yeah, so to me, that means um, any core location where food is moving through the system. So places where like food enters Clark County and is stored in warehouses, for example. Um, this one, I believe, is based on a policy from the menu of measures. And I think that was their intention as well. But it's it's more about those like kind of larger infrastructural points that would have a large impact on the whole food distribution system countywide, as opposed to individual locations. Although it could also, I mean, it's it's written in such a way that it could be inclusive of things like food pantries or individual stores. Right. So I don't know if we have time to really unpack that whole thing, but it sounds like there might be a couple pieces there, but I'll just circle it, a uh, mental circle. So that my, doesn't work to draw on my, my computer screen. Um, a mental circle to maybe come back to kind of what it's trying to say. And then I think Jude's and, and Abby, to your comments, there's some of these that might need to be bifurcated um, in terms of, you know, trying to say two things that may or may not feel connected to this group. So that's maybe more of a commentary than an equity lens, but um, uh, we'll just we'll just note it. Um, but the clarity of how it sets direction is important. So um, any other comments on kind of food and agriculture policies? 
And Jude, I also just appreciate you naming right that this climate, you know, what we're looking at doesn't operate in isolation. And so there is some intersection with some of the other components of the of the comprehensive plan. Okay, let's keep moving. I know we're, our time's tight and we're moving through a lot. So I appreciate folks. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good point to your comment. Um, livable communities? Uh, sure, I apologize if there's some background noise. Um, but for prepared and livable communities, um, uh, just really quick, you know, issues people have uh, had with severe weather included damage again to property and transportation routes or closure, inability to get to work, school, child care like locations. Day-to-day uh, -day challenges people identified that made it harder to cope with severe weather included things like lack of shade, parks, or green space in their neighborhood, or limited or no access to cars or public transportation. And um, some community members identified that past planning and policy decisions related to uh, BIPOC uh, communities make those communities more vulnerable today, so such as the history of, of redlining. Um, and when we asked people what they needed and didn't have or what they thought we should do to improve uh, resilience, there was strong support for ideas focused on increasing resilience um, infrastructure, so including like transportation infrastructure, as well as a lot of support for things related to environmental protection, enhancement, and pro promotion of sustainable practices. Um, lots of people identified a need for better transportation options and particularly enhanced access to public transportation for vulnerable groups. Um, other examples included uh, better safety, particularly during uh, when it's really heavy rain or visibility is low from severe weather, particularly for people traveling not in cars. Um, uh, better internet connection, uh, interest in having more safe options for refuge from extreme weather, more indoor, interest in more indoor recreation options, more shade, uh, more things like community pools. Um, faster repair and clearing of roads, drainage systems, and down trees, interest in neighborhood scale initiatives, uh, better coordination between the county, the city, and other agencies involved in emergency planning and response, uh, more outreach and notice and education with the public on local government planning, um, lots of suggestions on how to improve uh, transportation disruption and or how to address transportation disruption and improve community connectivity. Um, lots of feedback on how to improve community green spaces and corridors, our trees and natural systems and access to water. Um, and then uh, several people raised concerns on the impact of gentrification, pushing people out of their community, um, and benefits not necessarily helping those who are already um, here in the community. And that was sort of tied with interest in reducing sprawl while protecting trees and natural areas. All right, next slide. Yeah, thanks, John. So with that as, as a background, um, let's open it up for this section. And I guess as as you all are, are processing that, I'll just ask, I know we, we have a couple people virtually attendees, maybe folks in the room. I'll just ask if anybody's um, interested in offering public comment, because we'll we'll make sure we stop and create that time. Okay, so online, we'll, we'll, we'll take the next seven minutes um, to go through this, uh, this policy, then we'll ask for public comment, and then we'll come back and, and wrap up just so we honor that um, time on the agenda. of our prepared to live communities. Going high level direction. Thank you, Jude, for sharing a survey for folks.
Monica? Uh, it says um, G27P1. Okay. Plan for 30 minute communities. Um, uh, the 30 minute community, I mean, I like the number 20 or 25 better. Um, and so um, that was just uh, uh, something so people don't have to be in their cars and can just get to where they need to go if, if you can walk, you know? And so um, that was my comment for that one. I'm, I'm not feeling the 30 minute one. I mean, I could travel to Beaverton cruising uh, <laughs> in 30 minutes. Uh, and so I just, I feel like it's, uh, it's a little bit too big of a number for me on that one. Thanks, Monica. I don't know if there's any contacts for folks around how you land on 13 versus 15 versus 20 versus 25, um, other than being in a more rural county, but Dana? Yeah, yeah, I can say 30-minute um, community is just kind of like a buzzy current planning concept, but also I, I, the idea is usually that you can walk to these things within 30 minutes rather than drive to them in 30 minutes. Good clarification. Gabriella? Yeah, thank you. Um, I was thinking about that. It's actually um, the city is working in a 15-minute community planning, and uh, just FYI. Uh, that's what uh, the comp plan is sharing about 15 minute community so 15 minute walk to have um, stores uh, food stores uh, shopping uh, child care within 15 minute walk thank you thanks Gabriel. i know there'll be a fascinating conversation for a place like clark County, right, where you have kind of the urban and, and rural mix, right, and what it means for folks to have 15-minute walkable neighborhoods um, will be fascinating uh, discussion. I imagine you had some of that. Yeah, thanks for the definition, Dana. Other thoughts on livable communities? Yeah, Abby, jump in. Um, the only thing that I was thinking, and I don't know if this would be again, incorporated into this kind of a plan. I, I try not to get too specific in these recommendations, like you said, or like you suggested we not to. Um, but when we're talking about G28P1, um, integrating natural hazard mitigation planning, my first thought was just wanting to make sure that that, or not make sure, but clarify if that also includes looking at areas outside of Clark County, like Portland. Like I know that our organization recently has done some um, public engagement about the critical energy infrastructure hub. And I know that's a big concern by the community and like making sure that our plans correlate to the efforts to help mitigate risk in the case of an earthquake with that and the hazard that that would cause over here, especially with overburdened communities. Um, so I really liked that plan, <laughs> G28P1. I thought it was a good policy. I just wanted to like confirm that it also includes working with neighboring areas that would impact us as well. You might be varying into the implementation, but um, Jenna, just again, some of this is context for the conversation, right? So Abby, it sounds like you like the, the language at a high level and just had a question around kind of the regionalization of um, risk analysis and vulnerability, et cetera. Yes. Yeah, and this is Jenna, I can just add it. I think we can think about how to make that more clear. I, when I read this, I had been thinking just in the county. Um, so I think we can, uh, and, and you know, there's certain things the county has, uh, can directly impact, you know, and then there's the regional efforts the county can participate in and collaborate in, you know, with other, uh, with the city of Portland, and, you know, it's a larger regional effort. So I think we can let us think about wording so that it, um, uh, we've got the stuff we can do in the county and then we've got the collaborating in the larger region idea. Cool. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, thank you, Jen. Thanks for, for naming that, Abby. Thanks, Jenna, for thinking about how to, to maybe bring it in. And it, and it might be just, it might land as part of that implementation. Um, Right, implementing measures to reduce risk might be require some collaboration across jurisdictional boundaries. To your point, Abby, um, I do want to let's take another comment. Um, so, Monica, if you want to jump in, and I'm going to pause us for public comment and ask us to go through the last um, last section before we close out, Monica. 
Okay, I just want to say really quick in the chat that I put, I put I may be putting plant for 15 minute walking communities so that it's more understandable of that. Um, so that, that's all I wanted to say. I wanted to say it real quick so that um, if someone else had a comment, they could make a comment. All right. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate Yolanda, equitable community, accessibility to all. Um, so that might just be a, something that we want to make sure we do a language check um, to ensure that we don't miss the opportunity to name accessibility um, in these to your comment, Yolanda. Yes, and I didn't I didn't want to belabor us on the slide because you know, time is not on our side always, but when we talk about bettering our communities, um, addressing the inequities, right? And making sure that we create these so-called equitable environments and what may look equitable for me, Yolanda may not be equitable for the next person. For example, the next person may need uh, different, you know, access, accessibility issues. There may need to be not just parkway and greenery, but there may need to be um, accessibility within the bike, the the bikeways, the the bike trails, the walk trails that allow for people are that are in wheelchairs or people who are blind. So when we talk about creating accessibility, we need to be mindful and cognizant that we're creating these spaces so that everybody can enjoy these spaces. And my dream community, <laughs> I don't think it will ever come to fruition. Um, and I don't, I don't even think I could paint it if I wanted to, but it would just be a livable space for everybody where everything we need is in um, just, I wanna say not an arm's reach, but enough so that we can get out and walk and get some exercise and, and engage with our community. And, and the people that we're that we're supposed to be socializing with. So I'll stop there. I can go on and on. Well, and I, again, I've... I don't want us to stay on this slide. I want us to be um, truly progressive in this meeting, so. Yeah, well, I'll encourage you to do some sci-fi writing so you can imagine that world and help us uh, articulate it. Uh... Uh, a la Octavia Butler or something. Um, but I, 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 but lifting up with your other comment, I mean, I, I think when you see language like improved street connectivity and walkability, mm -hmm, right, mm -hmm. it's very, it's ableist language. So I think we can put some, so we can adjust it to make sure that right. we're filtering it through the lens of accessibility. Accessibility. So gonna, yeah. Yep, thank you. So I'm going to pause. I'm a, I don't know if it's, I got two names with a raised hand for public comment. I, so, um, uh, if there's folks in the room, which I can't see, but I'll offer uh, raise your human hand if you're in the room. Um, is it Don and, and, and Alona or Alana? Um, we're going to start online. Um, so if we can promote uh, or make accessible uh, the ability to speak for um, one of our uh, Steinke uh, participants, um, we'll just ask that you uh, uh, take up to three minutes to provide public comment. I Thank assume that's the This is Don Steinke, and I'll try to be brief. I have five quick comments. The natural gas that we usually have in our pipes in the county, that comes from fracking. Most of it comes from British Columbia, a thousand miles north of here. So renewable natural gas and renewable biofuels, that's a whole sketchy, uh, iffy proposition. Some of them are good and some of them are bad. Some of them put out more climate pollution than if you just burned fossil fuels straight up. And so it needs to be clarified. It, it matters on where where it's uh, used for energy. Like you don't want to spend a million dollars on a pipeline coming from a dairy farm to uh, be burned in my house. Uh, it'd be better to burn it right there on site uh, and make electricity than to put it in a pipeline. So it's, it's very complicated very complicated. Secondly, uh, regarding uh, for fertilizer and farms, we flush urine down the river every day, and then we pay money to make artificial fertilizer, which uh, it puts out a lot of methane just in the manufacturing of artificial fertilizer. And so the more natural fertilizer we can use, the better. Uh, number three on my list is, I read the comments from the last meeting, 
uh, and there was a number of people that said we need more incentives. Well, the incentives are in the Climate Commitment Act, and it was assumed that the Climate Commitment Act would still be viable today or tomorrow or the next day to provide those incentives. And we'll find out tomorrow during the election whether or not we have money for those incentives. Number four on my list is the, the question was mentioned about reducing sprawl and it was just being hinted at. Well, it's actually in the law. The law says reduce sprawl, the law that made this committee happen. And lastly, uh, regarding the critical energy infrastructure hub in Portland, we have our own right here. We have tank farms right here in Clark County. And, and so that's a threat and they are, are in located in moderately hazardous uh, subduction zone. Although the uh, the Portland thing, the Portland critical energy infrastructure is a far, far greater threat to the Pacific Northwest than what we have in Vancouver. That's all I have to say. Thanks for everybody for participating. All right, well, thank you, Don. I appreciate uh, your comments and your attention and your participation tonight. So thank you for, for joining and, and offering some insights. Um, I'll do a last call if there's other public comment. We'll capture cow pea as a great fertilizer for the notes. Thank you, Monica. <laughs> um, we'll just leave that. I was waiting to say that out loud. Um, okay, so let's let's jump back in. Uh, we got about time to move through um, one last section around natural areas and ecosystem services. So, Jenna, if you can do your thing, and then we'll um, ask folks to look at some of the policy language before we move to closing. Right, so severe weather impacts included all sorts of damage to trees and vegetation. And in terms of what people identified as what we need or should do, um, they, there was strong support for all sorts of ideas related to environmental protection, enhancement, and promotion of sustainable practices. Interest in education about plants that are better adapted for severe weather and changing climate conditions. Um, a need for better forest management to help reduce the size of fires and support early detection of fires. Um, uh, recommendation to support more jobs uh, in the sector. Um, there was youth um, identified an interest in getting more involved in the community and projects to help the environment. Um, and then all sorts of feedback and considerations on community green spaces and corridors, trees and natural systems, um, you know, preservation of existing trees and natural areas, um, and uh, a very long list related to that. Um, uh, also, again, concerns on the impact of gentrification, interest in reducing sprawl while protecting natural areas. Um, there was a recommendation to maximize alignment of the county's legacy lands program, which is the county's conservation futures program, um, with other open space program strategies, and a recommendation to protect culturally important traditional foods and natural resources. Awesome. Thank you. So let's move to the policy descriptions. And I won't describe what we're doing anymore because we've been doing it all night. Well, no, it just says folks are are um, processing. Uh, we did put again in the in email comments the comp plan uh, comp plan at clark.wa.gov or online to the link. So it's not the last time to participate, Gabriella. Yes, thank you. Um, where it says. <laughs> Uh, G13P1, uh, it talks about um, uh, pest resistant trees, shrubs, perennials, etc. 
uh, it needs to say something about removing um, aggressive species, stems that are no native. They're very aggressive to our environment. We see those everywhere, even when we're driving. Right, so not just not just promoting native um, uh, native plants, but also um, providing removing some, or yeah. eradicating um, yeah. um, aggressive species to our environment or to our ecosystem. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to? Every time you put something in the chat, I'll at least give you an opportunity to to speak to it. I, I, it's a it's a really um, powerful concept that you're you're bringing forward. Yeah, well, I think uh, these are awesome policies. It'll depend on how they're funded and implemented because they could encompass a lot of really good stuff, especially if they're integrated across these other uh, aspects, these other policies that are looking at jobs and inclusion and conservation and including the, the citizens that live here that you know besides the parks department and obvious folks is that we're all sort of charged with steward stewarding our environment yeah no, thanks Jude. And, and i you know that this i will take that comment also as a recommendation not just for kind of the cross-referencing, but may in and of itself be some addition to some of these pieces, right? So how do you um, look at these policies through the, the other benefits um, that they could provide? Monica? So yeah, reading over all these, and like these are great, I, I really do like them all, but it, also I'm feeling like there needs to be a, a piece of like a place where the ed education is happening, where it's like, we need to um, educate our, our public of like how to get to these things, like how to, how to do these things together. Um, in uh, an episode of The Great Simplification, it was like, uh, it says if you um, uh, have the community plant the trees or work in the, in, in, in the, in, in, uh, with them, it, it has a 90% more chance of actually like, you know, uh, uh, making it and, and, and thriving and everything uh, opposed to the, the other way of, of having, you know, it, 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 you know, people come out and, you know, are hired and all this and whatever, and it's not, it's not being taken care of by the community. Um, and so I really feel like a, a community, like an, a little bit more of a community piece of how to educate people on, uh, or a community about this. But I, I really like it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Monica. And it feels like, you know, that human ecosystem interaction uh, that I see in June's previous comment also speaks to to what you're describing. Um, it's really seizing the opportunity for for that relationship. So we only have a couple minutes left. I, I'm going to ask if we haven't heard from you. I'm going to again invite you in, um, or if you haven't, um, you know, any reflections. It doesn't have to be on natural um, areas or ecosystem, but just anything coming up for you, or anything you want to share, or something that you may have heard as we've had this conversation. And I always want to provide the opportunity. There's other ways, of course, to to give input and and um, as folks, I hope feel and and see, you know, there's a real relationship be, between. I think very intentionally in the way that this was attempted to be laid out today, um, seeing the relationship between the conversations and engagement that you all put so much energy into and how that's kind of been woven through and hopefully you're seeing it, right? Um, show up in, in the policy language and saw some opportunities for improvements this evening. So maybe I'll do a last call if I haven't heard from you. Um, if you want to add something, otherwise um, we'll move into next steps. Okay. 
Well, thanks for, for the conversation. I know there was a lot to move through and it was pretty quick. So I just appreciate folks uh, hanging in there, um, especially at a late afternoon on a you know, one hour darker Monday than it was last week. So Jenna, why don't you talk about next steps and help us close out? All right. Um, well, just as uh, we, we looked at this list before we had the conversation, so we'll just revisit it really quick. Um, so um, thank you all for providing feedback today. The project team, we're going to take what you said and try to think about possible revisions or changes to the policy list to incorporate your suggestions. Um, we're going to have a similar conversation at your December meeting looking at the greenhouse gas reduction policies. And then similarly, we'll work on incorporating your feedback. Um, our plan is to come back to you in January to show you, okay, here's what we did with what you said, um, have an opportunity for you all to give us more feedback and reflect on that. And we'll also talk, uh, have a discussion on an overarching equity policy for the climate chapter. Um, we've got other folks reviewing these policies too, so we're gonna take your recommendations, these other recommendations, and uh, package sort of a, a set of possible additional recommendations to the whole list. Um, we'll work with the CAG to sort through that, um, we'll have our EJC representatives in that conversation to help um, bring your your suggestions forward, and then that will, once the CAG makes their final recommendations, we'll move forward to the Planning Commission and County Council. Um, and then, Ben, I think there's one more next step slide. I think there is, because we have another meeting. Here. Yeah. Nope, not that one. Keep going. <laughs> that one. The homework. Let me go back real quick. I don't want to repeat myself too much, but um, okay, so I talked about the first item there that we're going to incorporate your feedback, um, but also wanted to remind you all, we did skip the EJC member announcement section of today's meeting, so if you have anything, if you send it to me, I can then rebroadcast to the whole group, so uh, please feel free to do that if you have anything you want to share, and remind you all um, to finish your engagement work if you haven't yet, and not only finish it, but then get get your stuff to Amy, Lauren, and I, you know, your progress reports, the, the feedback you collected, because that's what we need to be able to look at and, and analyze. Um, and then we'll see you in December. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jenna. And, and hopefully this will tee you up for, we're going to be doing a very similar exercise with greenhouse gas um, uh, strategy policies at our next meeting. Um, so appreciate everyone, uh, the energy and, and just the thoughtfulness of the conversation. I'll, uh, in my apolitical way, I'll, I'll just say, you know, elections uh, can bring a lot of emotions and, and feelings and, and both energy in lots of different directions. So take care of yourselves, take care of your people. Um, if you haven't voted, vote. Uh, exercise your right to participate in this democracy. And we will see you in December um, one way or the other. So uh, just take care of, your, of, your, uh, of yourself and take care of each other and have a wonderful night. Thank you all. We'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. You too. All right.